do have a variety of folks here tonight to support um, everything that's going on. Uh, we have representative from uh, the state uh, WDNR. We have the USGS representative, the Army, Army headquarters, and uh, personnel from the Army Environmental Command. So there are a variety of folks on hand tonight prepared to answer your questions. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to uh, Mr. Jansen, and he can give you an update on, uh, on the groundwater system. All right, um, I'm gonna give a very brief update. This is the only slide, just because it's a map. Um, so in September, we do a normal sampling round of the monitoring wells, and it's not a residential well sampling event. So it does hit up. Um, I know we're gonna go through a lot of the plumes in the, the next presentations, but we have the nitrocellulose on site. We have a deterrent burning ground in the northeast. We have a central plume over on the east side, and then the main propellant burning ground plume in the southwest corner that goes down towards the river. So the main sampling of September is hitting on this plume, the deterrent burning ground, and the propellant burning ground plume. Um, the results for D and T wise were fairly similar to previous testing done this year on the propellant burning ground plume. The source area there has had elevated levels of D and T in the last couple of years, and so that continues near the source, and that's part of the RI information. So the source area of that is up here. And then the deterrent burning ground plume up here, the, we've briefed before, is the offsite portion of that plume for DNT continues to be at an elevated level from previous sampling years. So no change in some of those based on even when we get some of the RI information, there's still some of the same data that we're finding. So no shockers, nothing dramatic changed, just another round of testing. And then we'll be doing more testing again on all these wells again in April of 2020. Okay, I'm just gonna give a quick update on the PASI for the PFAS that we did at Badger. Um, as I have presented a little bit of these slides, they're the same as what we presented in March, but since that time, we have done the preliminary assessment portion, which includes a historical records research and personnel interviews for folks that we could find. Obviously, um, the, the heyday of Badger was quite some time ago, so it was kind of difficult to find everything as you can imagine, but uh, this just gives an overview of what we did. Uh, we looked at 24 different historical documentations. Um, we looked at 11 preliminary areas that we thought might be considered. Uh, we came out and interviewed Joel, of course, uh, with SpecPro uh, for his historical site knowledge, as well as uh, Mr. Mueller at the, the museum since he was a former employee and had quite a bit of site knowledge as well. Uh, the result of that uh, was we found three areas of potential interest, as we're calling them, AOPIs. Uh, the former firefighter training area, which was operational just on the cusp of when uh, AFFF, aqueous film forming foam, was used, which is, you know, it started in 1968. And uh, we also looked at landfill 3646, and the reason for that is because when the remedial excavation was done at the former firefighter training area, when the soil was removed, it was placed in this particular landfill. So that is why that landfill was included as an area of interest. And then, of course, the propellant burning grounds. Uh, we did not find an actual release event that occurred within there, but because that area encompassed so many different types of activities, we wanted to include it just uh, to make sure that we didn't miss anything. So uh, that wrapped up the preliminary assessment part, and these slides are gonna be very familiar to those folks that had uh, previously seen my presentation in March. Uh, just to reiterate again, uh, when we did do the sampling events, uh, there are dedicated pumps in 
the wells at Badger and because those pumps may or may not contain any sort of Teflon components, we did per remove those pumps, purge 10 well volumes from each well to make sure we got a representative sample of the aquifer and did not have any sort of impacts from those dedicated Teflon components. Uh, again, this just goes over some of the, the sampling activities that we did perform in 2018. Uh, so we did do groundwater samples, we took some soil samples from the former firefighter training area, and then we also took some sediment and surface water samples from the uh, ponds downgrading of the sludge drying beds. And you guys have seen these before if you were present. So the soil samples, we did um, 19 soil locations. We went down to about 100 feet uh, in the former firefighter training area. And we had five intervals did have detections above the detection limit of two parts per trillion. So I'll get, to, I will double check that. But the high, what's interesting about this is that the highest PFOS and PFOA concentration was at 84 feet below grain surface. And that was at uh, one of the locations is all. And so because of that, we didn't find anything shallow, which was very interesting because even though only the top four feet was removed during that excavation, we would have expected to find uh, PFOS and other uh, PFAS constituents lower than the four feet if they had used that firefighter training area with a triple F is what we've seen programmatically across. And again, there's no soil cleanup standards right now. Uh, the groundwater sampling, we sampled um, 17 locations down gradient of the former firefighter training area and the propellant burning grounds. So these wells right here, quite a few nested pairs. We did have some detections of PFOS and PFOA at nine locations above the two parts per trillion uh, detection limit. The highest concentration of the blend of PFOS and PFOA was 19.5 parts per trillion at this uh, 9303D well down here but the 19.5 is well below the EPA lifetime health advisory of the 70 parts per trillion. This slide just summarizes the sediment and surface water locations at the um, pond down gradient of the sludge drying bend, and we did not have any detections in sediment or surface water at this location. This is just a summary of all of the tabular of the um, PFOS and PFOA data that we did uh, have. So you can see here that we have, whoops, wrong button, pardon me. We do have um, all the different wells, and so you can see here the, the 9303D was at 14 for PFOS and 5.5 for PFOA. These qualifiers here, just if, for your interest, those are from the laboratory. A U qualifier means that it was not detected. A J qualifier means it was in between the detection limit and the reporting limit of the laboratory. So the bolded are the detections that are above either a J flag or a detection. And you can see here that I believe well 1302 is the furthest down gradient well that we sampled and the hit was uh, a combination of 4.6 for the both of them. We did analyze for 16 other PFASs, and this uh, shows all of those different types of uh, analytes that we did sample for. While there's no regulatory standard for any of these right now, we did analyze for them in case in the future there becomes a promulgated standard, and then the Army will have this data in their back pocket so they know what they have. And these are just the maximum concentrations of each of those different constituents that we found in the groundwater at Badger. So yeah, in summary, um, all the groundwater samples that we collected on post were below the uh, health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion for PFOS and PFOA. Uh, the draft PSI report, it will be to WDNR uh, by the end of December. It's in headquarters review right now. And then the final PSI report 
is expected in spring of 2020, which will be after the WDNR and a public comment period for that particular report. Is that, are you saying that, that 70 parts per uh, whatever is safe to drink now? The groundwater there? Uh, the EPA has the uh, health advisory. Anything greater than 70 parts per trillion uh, would need to be uh, remediated or something to take an action taking. Anything below 70 parts per trillion is safe. Yes, groundwater is drinking water. Um, I have a question. I saw NG as in never G per milliliter or whatever. Was that nano or milli or a mis? This yeah. right here is a nano, nano. so that okay. is a parts per trillion, right. yes, okay. nanograms per liter. Other questions? Any other questions? First is a comment. I wanted to make you aware that the Wisconsin Division of Health has recommended a health advisory level for PFOA and PFOS combined at 20 parts per trillion, and the highest concentration that was detected is 19.5. So it's comparing it to 70 might not be appropriate for Wisconsin. Um, the other question I have is for Joel, and I'm looking at the northeast plume, and I noticed that in September, about a quarter of a mile east of the plant boundary, DNT was detected. And why is, and I don't understand why the, the plume map is drawn the way it is. So, Laura, you're asking about the way the plume is drawn here compared to? No, the deterrent burning ground plume. Oh, deterrent burning ground. And if you go down Spear Road about a quarter of a mile, there, there must be a monitoring well here. I have it on this. You can get back to me. Oh. You can keep that if oh, you want. Oh, okay. All right. Nothing specific for the group or? Well, it's just a, a comment at this point. When I looked at the more recent data, the, the plumes, how they are drawn, don't fit the newest data. That plume should be wi wider, for example. And the other thing I'm concerned about is defining like the eastern edge of the central plume, for example, you only have one single shallow monitoring well rather than a well nest. So the locations you have on your map are the different, are different Right, wells. you mentioned the September round of testing and I looked at it and it's at least a quarter, it's almost a quarter of a mile outside where the plume boundary is drawn. I, I can show you which wells, they're, they're not the right wells. Okay. You don't have them, you just don't, they're, they're in a different location oh. th than the map that you show. Okay, so that's your guys' map, so oh. if they're wrong, it's not my fault. <laughs> no, the bubbles. And what was your other question? I don't remember. Sorry. I... That's right. On the nest of monitoring. Oh, and it was just a comment that in, in, in defining the plume boundaries, um, this, the central plume, for example, oh, okay. on the eastern boundary, it's primarily just a single shallow water table well, like an A, a series well. Um, we do have a nest of wells in here that's deeper also. I, I know further up by the landfill, but oh, it's just a comment. We don't need to go into the whole okay. thing. Right, and I, I don't want to start a whole conversation. I just wanted to, you, I was okay. commenting on the material presented. Okay. Any other questions? If we don't have any other questions, uh, 
we need to take about a five minute uh, short break here so that we can get set up for the uh, RFI presentation. So uh, don't go too far away. Like I said, we're going to take uh, five minutes well ahead of schedule. Um, and then we'll get started as soon uh, as Mr. Kelly is uh, ready to go. Thank you. We, uh, we have Mr. Mike Kelly from Army Headquarters who will be presenting the information on the RFS for uh, the groundwater. Fantastic. Okay, good evening all. Uh, some familiar faces, hopefully for those who have been in the past, you may remember me. Uh, I think this is probably my third, if not maybe fourth, uh, public meeting. Uh, most memorable one was July 2017, where I had the opportunity to come in and, and share uh, the Army's message that we weren't going to be able to uh, build a water treatment plant. Unfortunate, and I'll acknowledge that again. Um, when I'm here tonight, uh, it was important to come back, continue the dialogue, continue the support uh, for the Army team, uh, but lay out a little bit more of what we've been doing with respect to the remedial investigation and feasibility study, which is really going to get us to uh, what we feel is the appropriate action uh, to address the, the past releases associated with the Army. So. Um, let's see, uh, Joel covered this, so I'm not going to hit it again. Uh, one of the observations I made during a past meeting that I attended, uh, we came in with the idea of feeling that we knew what you wanted to hear. Um, so I'm, I'm going to beg your impatience for a little bit. I have, uh, we have an, a presentation where we lay out what, what we see it, the problem is and how we're going to go about addressing it. But I do understand that many folks are going to have questions that you want to have answered. Um, of the four plumes, the nitrocellulase plume, excuse me, in the, the, the former Army Badger property did not have an unacceptable risk. So it's, the presentation is geared by the, th through the three plumes that do have risk. Uh, so what my intent would be would be to cover each of those individually. There's going to be some repetition. Uh, and what I would ask your indulgence is, uh, let me go through the first segment, discussing uh, propellant burning ground would be the first one. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. We'll go for as long as folks want to hear. Uh, there may be some carryover into the deterrent burning ground and central, central plume that we'll put on hold and address after that, because after, after I go through the slides related to the deterrent burning ground and the central plume, we'll, we'll uh, entertain questions and have a dialogue and discussion at that point, too. So. Uh, I am interested to hear the you know interest comments. I know uh, 8th of November, the Army released the draft report. Uh, it's in both the hands of uh, Wisconsin DNR, as well as many of you, I, I hope, had the opportunity to start to look at it. Uh, we welcome the, the feedback. Uh, we don't always receive feedback on remedial investigation feasibility start, study reports. That's not part of our standard cleanup process. Uh, but I would acknowledge it is part of the, the Wisconsin laws that, that they shared. And uh, considering where we've been and where we hope to go uh, moving forward, it is part of being transparent. So uh, fully supportive of, of making sure we hear your thoughts and feelings and observations uh, early rather than later. So um, with that, I will. Um, so we've been at this for a while, uh, 1980. Uh, Many of the investigations, and I apologize, I wish I, wish I had it in front of me as well. Um, I mentioned the four plumes. Uh, the presentation is going to cover mostly the, the first three. Um, Joel walked through the, you, you're very knowledgeable, and, and you guys have heard this in the past, so you, you know which way groundwater goes. It's all showing up for the most part in the river. Um, and it's primarily what we're looking at in terms of what problem we're trying to solve is chlorinated solvents and, and explosives. Uh, an ammo plant, uh, explosives isn't a surprise. So um, throughout the process, the remedial investigation, let me at least set a little framework of, uh, recall the, the remedial investigation is intended to define whether we have a problem. And then when we get into the feasibility study, based on the results of the RI, a remedial investigation, the feasibility would study would tell you how to best solve that problem. So uh, <clears throat> we've done it. The remedial investigation was focusing both on the soils uh, and now the groundwaters. Most of the, the soil areas that happened um, 
uh, under permits with the state of Wisconsin. Uh, propellant burning ground, deterrent burning ground. We're essentially treating a hazardous waste uh, required a permit. We went through closure uh, with the state of Wisconsin. Uh, that's all been documented. So what we're left with is the uh, groundwater uh, remedial investigation and feasibility study. I, as I said, I, I, we put in a lot. I don't intend to cover anything. You have the complete slides. There, well, there's the slide deck, I think it's 58 slides. So some of this I'm gonna go through quick. If I go through too quick and you want more details, I'm more than happy to walk through it, but wanted to kind of re-baseline what we've done, you know, where we think our source areas are, how did these groundwater plumes get generated, uh, the Army through the ammunition production process, you know, waste pits were commonly used. Uh, we had landfills. Landfills, while it, you know, there's, it's standard practice uh, for any environmental landfill that upon closure you, you put a low permeability cap or a, uh, you try to reduce the infiltration when it rains so that the rainwater doesn't come in contact with what's in the landfill. So capping of landfills. Uh, so we put some barrier caps for landfill one, for example. Um, some cases it was a combination of both excavating and then capping afterwards, uh, trying to do the best we could given some of the depth of the contamination uh, and the extent that we had. Uh, so we had uh, ground, off-site groundwater monitoring starting in 1990. Uh, for the propellant burning ground, uh, it's the waste pits, uh, we believe is the source area. Um, and it is unfortunate in the 90s, we also had uh, three, three uh, times when uh, the residential wells exceeded the uh, Wisconsin res uh, enforcement standards, which led us to replace those wells. So when we're, took, when we're doing our remedial investigation, one of the first goals um, of, of several I would offer is to define the nature and extent of contamination. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we know the nature, it's explosives, it's chlorinated solvents. There's a few other products that were evaluated through the process, but the extent is the left and right boundaries, similar to the question earlier, you know, how wide is those plumes drawn? But there's also what we found over time is that some of these plumes will actually, the, the, they'll sink more or less, or they'll go down. They're not always at a, a, the same depth. So it's also important to look at these plumes when you talk about nature and extent of contamination in a kind of like left and right, but also uh, the, the height or the depth, so to speak, uh, going forward. Um, let's see, uh, this, this in fact is talking about the, uh, where we found the carbon tet. Uh, through the remedial investigation, uh, we'll initially look at uh, what we would call contaminants of potential concern, COPCs, and I'll contrast that with contaminants of concern. So the Wisconsin, uh, I'm sure you all know, there's the preventive action levels and the enforcement standards. So in the absence of a MCL or other drinking water standard, the enforcement standard is set at a risk of 10 to the minus six, and the preventive action limit is set at one-tenth of that, which makes it 10 to the minus seven risk uh, for the cancer contam contaminants that would contribute to a cancer. But not all contaminants contribute to cancer. There's also some adverse health effects uh, that we capture from our non-cancer side. And that it is, the enforcement standards would be one, um, and then the preventive action levels would be, instead of one-tenth, it would be one-fifth. So it would be, uh, essentially 0.2 uh, of a hazard index is the way we look at it. So when you see the, the, the risk slides that we're gonna present, um, that, that's when we talk about what is the percent incremental of the change in risk. But the preventive action limits is what we use in the RI to identify what are the contaminants of potential concern. Um, and that's what we did originally. Uh, you know, I think the previous effort uh, we had several years ago was relying too heavily on the preventive action limits to establish whether we had a problem or not. So the preventive action limits, if you're talking about a, a cancer-causing chemical, you're, you're, we, have, we were evaluating it based on a 10 to the minus seven risk at the time. Um, and, and there wasn't this circle of risk assessment or you know, what we would have expected or had, would, had hoped to see um, going forward, but it's okay. Um, uh, but to risk, let me talk a little bit about risk. Um, Risk is a combination of a source, 
uh, there's a pathway, and you have a receptor. So using this as an example, uh, we, we talked about the waste pits at the pro uh, propellant burning ground. Those would be the source. The pathway would be these plumes as the, the contaminants move from the source area and migrate uh, off, off site. Uh, in many cases, uh, for example, the, if the contaminants were staying on the former Badger property, then we have the transfer documents controlled to what extent we can, uh, uh, folks can access groundwater. But once it gets off site, we don't have that control. So the exposure would be, and it's not so much, there's some here in the propellant burning ground, but there's more so in the deterrent burning ground in the central plume where the receptor is residential areas. Um, so as an example of the source pathway receptor, if, if the, you know, we could have a source, we could have a pathway, but if there were no receptors, there would be no risk. Um, but if there's all three, there would. And what we did when we did the remedial investigation, we looked at what receptors were offsite. So what you're gonna see in the report is when we were evaluating risks on site, they're the receptor, uh, we, still have, we still have our upper and lower bounds that is established by uh, the Superfund laws. Uh, we follow the, the Badger cleanup is uh, consistent with what we would, what EPA would do at a federal NPL site uh, in terms of making risk management decisions and uh, defining the risk range. Uh, but we did look at, for the offsite area, the, uh, we would take a more conservative approach and use a, uh, a lower risk number. So what CERCLA would tell us is that an acceptable risk range is between an incremental increase of cancer of 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus six. 10 to the minus four is the higher level, 10 to the minus six is a more conservative level. Um, for the on-site areas, we elected to use the 10 to the minus four, which is consistent with, with what CERCLA requires, but recognizing the communities uh, and folks using groundwater as a drinking water off-site, uh, we applied the uh, 10 to the minus six is our point of departure. And when I say point of departure, what I mean by that is what, what, what level of risk gets you into a point where you need to do something? Because uh, that's really what uh, uh, we're looking to do. So moving on, uh, our, our chemicals of potential concern, the carbon tetrachloride, ethyl ether, also used during the production process, uh, TCE, we see TCE. Uh, at many of our Army installations and our cleanup sites. It did really well for its intended use. Um, and then obviously, uh, as an, a former ammo plant, the dinitrotylenes uh, are a major component for, for each of the plumes. Um, so one of the, unfortunately, well, it's not, it's one of the good things we have here, um, there is probably more data for this site than any other uh, cleanup site in the Army that I've been associated with over time. And these time series maps, the four of them kind of show, you know, over time you can see, uh, you know, we have basically, uh, I hate to do math out loud, 30 years of, of, of groundwater data in terms of understanding how things are changing. Um, and then as you see over on the upper right, sometimes things don't go very linear. Um, and we have some others, we see some of it right in here, and there'll be, we have another couple slides, especially in the last year or two, um, where the uh, concentrations in groundwater where various uh, chemicals of concern have increased. So, you know, when you think you, you kind of have it understood and you have 30 years of data to, to develop a model of what you think is happening, but you got to go with what the, where the data takes you. And in the last couple of years, we had had some instances where locations, the groundwater concentrations have, have increased, and we need to, to make sure we're, we're adapting to that and making sure uh, uh, whatever remedy is in, uh, implemented is, is addressing those problems. Uh, here's another example of the, um, what we have on the, uh, the, the red here would be our uh, groundwater elevations. Uh, and then here in the about 2016 time, June 2016, you know, high rainfall 17 into 18, the water levels uh, increasing. And then 
you, you know, you have a, a representative spike there in terms of the groundwater concentrations. Uh, in, this, in this case, on the left-hand side, it may be hard to read, but that's the total DNT concentration. So the blue bullets on this chart are the DNT concentrations, as an example. Um, and, and one may ask, you know, here we had a, a high groundwater concentration, a high groundwater level, I should say, uh, yet we didn't necess necessarily see that associated increase. This was actually during a period in the 08 to 12 time period where the ERM and MERM systems were still operating. Uh, and it was also contemporaneously during a period where we, we had some of the in situ best system was operating as well. So, you know, I think the, the difference between here and here, um, we had the treatment systems that were operated. If the systems weren't operating, we may have seen a spike in, in this area too. But once again, you know, things don't always fit into a nice perfect box. So you got to take what data comes. Um, and we have, like I said, we've, you know, even though we took a step back two years ago in order to uh, reevaluate what our path forward would be, we've continued to, to do our groundwater sampling, continue to make adjustments, uh, even in within the last year, replacing a, a residential well, uh, using the same criteria that we've used uh, historically uh, until we can get uh, the, the documents in order and, and make sure we've we're got the right uh, remedy going forward. Um, So oftentimes in our remedial investigations, and you'll see this in the report, we, we, it, we use what's called a conceptual site model. Uh, conceptual site model, um, you know, when we're going our, when we're evaluating the source, the pathway and the receptor, this would be an example of the different geologic, different types of soil, whether it's a clay or gravel or even clay. Groundwater is gonna move more readily through a sandy, gravelly uh, interval than it would a clay. So understanding what's in the subsurface, because our challenge as environmental professionals, we can't see where the contamination is. We're just basing it off what we have in terms of our sampling data. Um, so here's the big, here's our, our, our reveal moment. This, this is the uh, results of uh, the risk assessment that we did. Uh, and what happens is the, we, had, we took all of our chemicals of potential concern, COPCs, uh, ran them through the risk assessment process uh, so what you would see here, instead of chemicals of potential concern, would be a, just contaminants of concern from our risk basis. And those contaminants of concern go back to my analysis. When we're talking on site, it's because this number exceeds a 10 to the minus four. And in this case, it exceeds a 10 to the minus six. Same would be greater than 10 to the minus four, greater than 10 to the minus six. Um, so this gets us, uh, this recognizes what we had as an obligation in the Army cleanup program to recognize there was an unacceptable risk. Uh, and then uh, each of it would be a, a little bit, uh, you know, the hazard index. Uh, and then this, these, would, these would be the contaminants that are contributing to each of these risks uh, going forward. Uh, what you'll see in the report, um, it com this is a common way we lay out uh, from a risk perspective. Uh, it starts out with, you know, we, we focused on the waste disposal pits, for example, that's our source areas. We recognize there's gonna be some leach in the groundwater or maybe the, the material was put in groundwater to begin with. It makes its way into our contaminated groundwater. The groundwater is gonna migrate down where potentially, and in, in this case, it actually people do, the community is using in part, drink, uh, groundwater for drinking water. Um, for completeness, uh, we also looked at, um, we are talking about chlorinated solvents and uh, explosives. The solvents in particular have a tendency to volatilize. So the other thing our risk assessment looked at was the chemicals in the groundwater, do they volatilize into the, the pore space in the soils where they could potentially migrate into the uh, building foundations and then up through uh, into the indoor home, indoor air of the homes. Uh, fortunate piece is that uh, the analysis for all three plumes showed that vapor intrusion into an in indoor air is not a problem. So it's back to what I think we all knew was the problem, and that is uh, contaminated groundwater that could, uh, you know, what is the risk associated with uh, consuming ground, contaminated groundwater? Um, so for the propellant burning ground, uh, here are the, the original five that, that came out of that process. 
uh, the ethyl ether, I believe, was only on post rather than off post. Um, but you know, that's what got us to the, the, the risk basis there. So now that we have a understanding of the characterization of the site, we know the nature and extent, we've done our risk assessment, uh, there's a basis for action because our risk uh, was above the threshold, whether it was 10 to the minus 6 off-site, off uh, 10 to the minus 4 on-site. Uh, the next step is to develop our remedial action objectives. So I, I, it is important, I believe, to understand, or at least I will hope to clarify, there is going to be a subtle difference between the results of the risk assessment and so the risk assessment decide, defends or does, that tells you that you have a problem. When that problem ends is not based on the risk assessment. It's actually based on, in this case, it'd be the Wisconsin enforcement standards for the most part. Uh, it's either the enforcement standards or uh, the federal state drinking waters or maximum contaminant levels, MCLs. So, and oftentimes the, the, the DNR uh, enforcement standards and the MCLs are one and the same. Um, so there's, um, um, there, there's, there's comparability or, or equity there. Um, so our goal uh, when taking an action would be to restore groundwater to the uh, enforcement standards for each of the contaminants of concern. Uh, we're going to protect uh, human health by preventing exposure. Uh, that's pretty straightforward uh, on the former Army property where our property transfer documents are restricting use of groundwater. So limiting, limiting exposure in those areas is pretty straightforward. Uh, we are continuing to have the dialogue of you know, how can we provide notice and you know, what is, you know, how can we make sure or, or facilitate the preventing exposure uh, for the off-site areas where we don't necessarily have control. Um, we probably need, there's more work or dialogue that needs to happen there. Uh, and ultimately our goal is to minimize the impact on the environment. Um, so what we do in the feasibility study next, um, develop our general response actions. I, I mentioned the, the land use controls, that's a key part of it. Um, we've used uh, the, the development of the, the, the new water resources in the form of the of replacing wells when we exceed the enforcement standards, uh, and then either some kind of groundwater treatment, uh, groundwater containment. Uh, the, the past effort uh, in the, the previous reviews, and, and what you'll see is it's a, a several variants of what was done in the past, but the groundwater treatment can either be an active or a passive methods. And when I say active, it's either pulling or pushing being a little bit more aggressive in terms of trying to address the contaminated areas. And the passive treatment is, would be monitored natural attenuation, or m and uh, used throughout, oftentimes used for chlorinated solvent sites, um, as well as, and then the, sometimes there's a combination. There's a combination of maybe a little bit of, of active treatment to kickstart the process, uh, and then it transitions to an m and uh, recognizing that it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, the ERM and MERM, I think, are good examples there where those systems operated for a number of years, but they, they, they started to see their levels of, of uh, diminishing returns. So it's, you know, in that case, there's a combination of, that would be an example of maybe starting with the active treatment through the pump and treat and then transitioning over to an m and type remedy. Um, we initially screen each of the alternatives based on the effectiveness. Do we think it's really, I mean, if it's not going to work, we don't want to, do anything. We're not going to continue the analysis. Um, implement, implementability, uh, is it really, you know, can we do it? Um, you know, there's, there's some technologies out there that do, do pose some challenges, but I think for here we have a host of options that uh, are readily implementable. Bless you. Um, and then cost. Uh, cost is, is, you know, is, is going to be a factor, um, but it's going to be, you know, there are, you know, it's going to be costly uh, to address groundwater remediation here at Badger, uh, regardless of the options. So as we look at it, I think going forward, <coughs> after the remedial investigation feasibility study effort is finished, uh, we'll move into a proposed plan where we'll put together, uh, you know, the actual remedy for each area. Uh, but the combination of an active passive treatment uh, is going to look at some of those trade-offs between, you know, if I use active treatment, can I reduce my overall sampling or lifetime of, in terms of restoring groundwater? You know, how quickly can I, can I get to my remedial action objectives? But I can't overemphasize the importance of, you know, the remedial action objectives is, is where we, is, is what it's going to take to claim success. 
So at the end of the day, before the Army can claim success here, we're going to have to... Not at, here, let me... Remedial use 101, here we go. Um, the, the, the enforcement standards is going to be the metric or the bar we're going to have to hit going forward. Um, and uh, so that includes uh, both, and you'll see it if, well, I'll go back to here since I tried to do it. Um, in some of the plume areas, we have uh, the common uh, explosives, the 2-6, um, but then we also have uh, identified some issues with the, the, the total di dinitrotoluenes. So when we talk about the total dinitrotoluenes, a lot of focus is put on 2,4 and 2,6 DNT because the original technical grade DNT was about 95% each of those two products. So the 5% the of, the, of the three minor isomers, you know, it, it tends to get lost. Um, what was it, about 10 years ago, the state of Wisconsin issued the total DNT levels for all of the isomers. So uh, the total DNT number, we're also looking at the, the 2, 3, the 3, 4, and the 3, 5. So uh, in the case of the deterrent burning ground, um, we actually, you know, that addresses all five of the DNT isomers. Uh, but as it proved out for the uh, central plume, it was really the, uh, the 2, 6 dinitrotoluene, which was the, the driver uh, going forward. So here's uh, remedial action alternatives. Um, no action. That's our, it's included because we have to include it. It's a method of how we compare things. But in reality, once we decide there's an action required, the no action alternative is a throwaway option. So it's really not, it's there for completeness, but it's, um, uh, as I said, it's really a throwaway option. Uh, monitor natural attenuation, you know, that was in our prior uh, documents. That was, that, was a, that was a plan at, at one point in time. Uh, pump and treat, well, we had the ERM, we had the MERM. Uh, we know that'll work. You know, when we go back to the um, technology screening process in terms, I gotta find the right one here. Um, effective implement, you know, we know we can implement a pump and treat. Um, it was effective. Whether it actually met the goal at the end of the day is subject to um, probably some discussion. Uh, the anaerobic bioremediation, uh, we had some variants of this in the past. We operated the what was known as the BEST system. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit a little bit more on that. Uh, but we also have to recognize that a tool in our toolbox in terms of remedies would be uh, the well replacement. Uh, and, and what you see, what you'll see in the RIFS contemplates, you know, the worst case scenario, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's really there to, uh, to round out, uh, to potentially complement uh, some of, you know, for example, historically in the previous documents, we had the MNA paired with the uh, uh, well replacement. Uh, and then the, the source area treatment number six, four and six for each of the, uh, the propellant burning ground and the deterrent burning ground has a four and six option that uh, alternative four focuses on the entire plume in terms of treating it. Alternative six is just focusing on the source area. Um, I guess one could argue we could have put them back to back, but it, it was, you know, it was, it, you know, an evaluation that, hey, we don't necessarily have to do, if we focused on the short term or the source area and paired that up with some other options, maybe that's an alternative too. I won't spend a whole lot of time. We do nothing. We don't monitor. It's it's really a non-starter, so I won't. Um, uh, MNA is uh, fairly consistent with what we've done in the past. Uh, continuing to monitor, understand uh, the dynamics of the plume that it changes over time, uh, and and we we do feel that 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 over the long term, uh, when we do our analysis. Um, we do make an effort to estimate the remedial time frame. I think in an MNA, uh, 30 years, uh, we did just, I mean, to be fair, it, the MNA is probably at least 30, it's probably gonna be longer uh, if, we, if this was chosen. So, uh, uh, but our standard CERCLA and, and feasibility study guidance would tell us that we base it off of a, a 30 year estimate, and, and we have done that. Uh, but we do recognize that come year 31 as a federal entity, that we're gonna be paying, if, we cho if that remedy was chosen, uh, we would still be monitoring, uh, uh, you know, paying for 31 through year as uh, whatever was required. 
Uh, pump and treat, we, we saw this, uh, you know, we know this will work. Um, the evaluation, what you'll see in the, or the FS portion of the report, uh, focuses on some mobile treatment systems. So uh, we initially start with four extraction wells, pair that up with four mobile treatment units. Um, and then uh, depending on how we see the geometry of the plumes change, we have the flexibility to move these mobile treatment systems and install a new extraction well so that we can move to the the, the areas, the plume areas that really need to, to get hit hard. Um, positive side, these are estimates. Um, and the truth in lending, it, it would likely take longer because there's dynamics that um, absorption and, and other things that happen in the subsurface that we just can't see and, and completely quantify. Uh, but there's, you know, we, we do expect in general, it won't necessarily be this short, but we do expect, you know, by implementing an active remedy rather than the passive remedy that we see with M&A, that, that our pumping time would be less. Um, but once again, we realize we're probably on a sampling, we're in here for the long haul in terms of, of uh, doing the monitoring, collecting samples both on site and in the residential wells. So the anaerobic bioremediation, um, I, I will, uh, let me, I guess, guess set the, the stage a little bit for this. It, 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 is, it involves using uh, what's called the emulsified vegetable oil. And uh, there are certain contaminants that do well in an aerobic environment where there's air involved. And there are certain contaminants do better in a, when there's no air involved or, not, or anaerobic in this case. So the, the, this technology is intended to, we, are, we would be pumping in the vegetable oil into the subsurface so that it, in the groundwater, the, the bugs that are there to break down uh, the contaminants, whether it's the DNTs or the uh, uh, chlorinated solvents, they exist already. You know, we have, there's evidence that that exists. The anaerobic uh, degradation option with the vegetable oil is intended to get the, oil, get the substrate to the right location to, cre to create the conditions that'll promote further growth. It's kind of kick-starting the process. So some of this is act, uh, occurring already. The intent is you, you pump it in. Um, to compare and contrast alternative three with the pump and treat, you're pulling out the contaminated water, uh, treating it, and then discharging it. In this case, we're pushing in the substrate, or the, in this case, the vegetable oil, where it creates uh, the, the right environment for those bugs, and they are, it's microorganisms and it's, you know, you're creating, uh, you know, they like to feed on the DNT and the, uh, the, the chlorinated solvents. So you're just creating the right atmosphere for them to be successful. Um, and then th there is a potential for reapplication. Uh, so what, based on the, uh, the input from the team, we believe that by doing the injection, so in this case, the more robust uh, option is uh, treatment up here towards the source zones but then uh, several lines uh, throughout the plume to help create that biodegradation in, in the subsurface. Uh, and then by, by doing it, the, the first application, uh, the historical experience in the data suggests uh, that it'll create an active zone that'll continue to treat for two years. Um, so after that, we're either looking at re-injecting or this is a good example or an alternative where we could potentially pair it up with an M&A alternative four kickstarts the process, and then after that initial process, it kicks it transitions into M&A to try to, to to promote the, the breakdown in the subsurface. Um, well replacement, um, you know, obviously if, if we have an exceedance of the enforcement standard, uh, we're replacing the wells. That that's been our approach uh, since the 90s when we first started replacing wells. Oops, sorry, Joel, if I if I broke your thing. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. My apologies to the AV guy if that just resonated too much. Um, so uh, we'll keep this one in the, uh, the, the, the bag of tricks here. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Now I think I lost... Uh, what I'll do it manually for a second.
So just to compare and contrast, here's uh, alternative six, a little bit more focus in the, it's just one line uh, in the source area, so we're focusing more on the, the source zone uh, rather than multiple lines. Uh, and, and what you'll see is, you know, that, that does have an impact. Uh, uh, cost is lower because we're injecting fewer uh, of those. Thank you so much, Jason, appreciate it, that's kind. Um, so there's, there's the big difference between the, the two of those. Uh, the alternative four, we had several lines coming down through here uh, versus just the one uh, going forward. Okay, that's my transition to the deterrent burning ground. So I, I will provide, an, uh, you guys have been patient, attentive, so what questions can I answer? Yes, ma'am, we'll get you a... Uh, Uh, when you refer to um, receptors of um, pro problem chemicals, be, you know, human reception, do you count the river as a receptor? And are these fish, do, do these chemicals bioaccumulate in fish and then possibly to, you know, other animals like birds and, and people and then humans? It, it, good question. Um, so there, there's two pieces of the risk assessment. There's the ecological risk, which is really where you're referring to. And then the, or in part, uh, to the river, then bio, people eat fish out of this river, right? You know, yes. and also to waterfowl and people eat ducks and geese too. This is where I'm going to phone a friend. Joel, AEC team, any thoughts on that? Um, do we do it fish consumption, for example, from the river? Is there do we have do we is there evidence to suggest that would be a concern? Did I, did I, is that what you're looking for? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm looking for maybe somebody should check in to do these chemicals bioaccumulate in fish, in which case they are possibly, uh, um, a, would, a human would be the final receptor because they would eat these fish. Right. Oh. Well, the, these levels, especially for the DNTs, they're, they're low. I mean, the five part per billion, um, or 0 0.05, or that's five, right? Zero five. Zero 05, thank you. Um, you know, those are low levels, so yeah, well, and, and so the focus maybe prematurely is too much on human consumption of drinking water, so, um, but we'll take that back. Thank you. Mr. Um, Mike, I, nice to see you. I, I do okay. have a question. Oh, where's the, I'm sorry, where's the, uh, yes ma'am, go ahead. I, I've been holding this. Uh, where can I find out more information about the use of EVO uh, to do this job? And also a different uh, attack. Has anyone investigated the possibility of using mushrooms or mushroom extracts or something like that? Um, I'd like to know the chemistry, the biochemistry of how you know these organisms, what the organisms are. I would, I'd be curious about that, mm -hmm. and um, how the EVO increase. Do they also eat? the oil or it increases their numbers? I, I just have a lot of questions. It's sort of my field, but um, I mean, I'm in biology. Okay, so. so um, like what you say, we'll, we'll get, well, what we'll do for you is we'll work to get some of the technical papers because this isn't the first time it's been used. You know, it, it's actually become more of a, it's very common for, especially the chlorinated solvents, but also the, the, the explosives too. So um, there have been some studies that actually measure um, how fast these a certain concentration of microorganisms would uh, take care of these uh, pollutants? So, yes. Yeah, yeah so, so we have other examples with uh, other explosive sites in groundwater. So uh, one example is in Nebraska. They use a combination of uh, uh, molasses so you use a sugar that, you know, what you're trying to do is feed the native microbes to grow. So you can use a sugar and that'll kick them, kick start them really fast. And then what you do, you add a little more sustainable um, um, uh, feed element. And in the case of Nebraska, they were using um, whey. Uh, here we're proposing using vegetable oil. But probably what we would do is look for 
uh, appropriate food stocks that are regionally available because you know if we don't have to ship it in from as far plus it takes advantage of local uh, uh, capability the other thing uh, we could take a look at is also uh, corn syrup and uh, some other additives so there's a lot of things we can use uh, even in some cases at a few places we used uh, out of stock uh, uh, coca-cola or pepsi products syrups you know, from uh, bottling plants, uh, even in one case, you know, used uh, uh, out of stock, uh, you know, beer. So, you know, you know, there's a lot of things you can use. So it's just really what's regionally available. But the really cool thing about this is we're really relying on the native microbes. We're not introducing anything exotic. We're just trying to grow them. And once they start feeding, what they tend to do is once the populations grow and then the food source starts to starve, they attack everything else. And then so they go after the complex chlorinated compounds or go after the explosives. And it's been quite um, effective at some other groundwater sites. So. And the degradation products of this process are, are not harmful to humans or the So one of the things we would do is, um, based on the available chemistry and lab work, we would take a look at breakdown products, make sure that it's going down to simpler sources. You know, it's going to break down to simpler compounds and simpler elements. So we want to make sure we don't introduce any uh, intermediates mm -hmm. uh, with that. So that's pretty standard. We probably would do that both with lab studies and some additional chemistry work that would be done in addition to the normal monitoring. So is this type of thing available on the internet? Thank you. Yeah, and Kathy, I think when we do that, what I would suggest, I mean, there's really two parts I see to your answer to your question. One's the academic side that gets into the science of, you know, how the bugs grow and how, you know, they'll get into the, you know, they all have names and they're Latin usually, or in, so I won't try to reproduce, restate them. But the, uh, so the, the, the academia, the various universities that are doing these studies, they'll tell you, yes, it works. But then we also have the piece that, that Randy's talking about, like at Cornhusker and other of the former ammo plants, where we've used the technology. So, and it's not only at the former ammo plants, but you know, it's the sites with chlorinated solvents and whatnot. So we have practical applications where this technology works. So I think to really get at your question, there's the two parts, kind of providing the academia background of, of what it's all about, you know, what's really happening, but then also showing where it's worked successfully in similar type locations. Yes, sir. Um, this is my first meeting here, and I, I see 30 years and two years and eight years uh, on there. Uh, what, from what period does that time start, or is it? Sure. Um, well, I would call the, the 30 years of the sampling is kind of a rolling number. Uh, we just use that from a planning perspective. You know, we've already been at sampling since 1988, so we're already at 30 years. So you know, that's kind of a, so, um, so that's, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, and it's, it's within, I, I won't get into too much of the details because I'm not, uh, if, if the, the feasibility study guidance from EPA oftentimes it will talk about a 30 year present value cost. Um, the Army and any other federal agency can't take advantage of the present worth. When they do that calculation, they're assuming, let's say the present worth was $5.2 million. That means you put $5.2 million in a bank and come year 31, the interest is now paying for that remedy. So we can't do that. You know, the federal government pays based on what Congress gives us. So, you know, we're not putting money aside, but it is standard practice within the cleanup world to, to base it off of 30 years. So we're bracing it off of the 30 years. So we're comparing the various alternatives. Uh, we don't expect it to only be 30 years. I think for many of these, it probably will be more. Um, but when you're comp right now, all we're doing is comparing alternatives. We're not, you know, once the alternative is selected, we're going to implement it going back to my earlier statement until the uh, WDNR 140 enforcement standards are met. So it's just an estimate to give us a cost basis uh, going forward and, and compare it to the other options. So when we get, when we 
alternative, then that's when the 30 years starts. Roughly. Yes, and, and the, the, the third, so, but, but recall, I mean, the 30 years is kind of like from a planning number. You, you also mentioned the two years. Right. So you, you put the substrate, in this case, it's the vegetable oil. You, you're pushing that into the soil. The bugs are kind of using that as a food source. So what, what, in practice, what we're seeing is that food source is going to be depleted in about, or that, that zone is going to stay active in terms of being able to break down the, the, whether it's the solvents or the DNT for a two year period. So that's when we need to kind of relook at, are we gonna inject again? And part of that evaluation would be like, okay, we're gonna continue to monitor after two years, was it worth it or not? You know, are we seeing reductions? If we're seeing reductions, then yes, we would, we would look to do another injection and, and re reapplying. If it's not doing what we would have expected, then we need to look elsewhere. Uh, the challenge with this type of alternative is because you're pushing it is making sure that that substrate or in this case the vegetable oil gets to the right place so you know if you're not creating that in sub subsurface environment to break down the contaminants where they're located i mean the challenge of any cleanup project is you can't see what's below the surface we, we do a lot of sampling we have the nested wells to understand at, at depth where the contamination is uh, but then when we're looking at uh, the slide with alternative four, uh, the multiple lines, it's a, uh, a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, but it's, you know, this is, it's creating that larger area that we expect the treatment to occur. Yes. Uh, hi. <laughs> I have a host of questions, but I'll just ask a couple right now. How much input does the community and the RAB have in which of these alternatives are chosen. And I read through the study and it just immediately took out the community well because it said that the Army didn't have the authority to do that. I guess I would like another explanation as to why the Army does not have the authority to do that. And if the Army doesn't, is there someone else in the government who does? So the, uh, we do this work under what's called the Defense Environmental Restoration Program, which uh, mirrors our, the, the, whether it's the circular or corrective, record corrective action, both, both are done under, under DERP. Um, but it's, we have the authority to address the contamination uh, posing an unacceptable risk. So uh, where the, community members are drinking the water today, they're, they're, we do not have an exceedance of the enforcement standards. Uh, and so we can't put a well in for in a location where uh, there, there's not uh, evidence of a, you know, an exceedance, uh, in this case, a drinking water standard. Uh, and that's what the 140 standard is for the DNTs and for the benzene and TCA and some of the other solvents. It's the, the as I noted earlier, it's the, the, the 140 standard, enforcement standards is the same as the uh, maximum, the Safe Drinking Water Act, MCL. So, uh, um, but it's, the Army does, Army's mission is to fight and win wars. We're not in the business, unfortunately, of, of, of building water treatment plants and we can't treat, we, we ran it through um, uh, for legal review and it came back that we do not have the authority to build a water treatment plant uh, here and, and that hasn't changed. Um, so what we're looking at is what is the other alternatives? Um, recall the last version of our submittal had really, well, it was three options, but all, when we, it was the same, no action, so you really talk about two options. It was the M&A and the, the public water treatment system um, and it was the uh, in situ work, if I recall. Was that the, the, the last one? So, you know, what we've looked at uh, in this case is expanding that, recognizing that the, the public water system is not a, an option for us. Uh, but, you know, M&A, um, at some point in time, will, I think will always be part of at least one or more of the, the plume areas, uh, but also look into expanding the, the source area treatment anaerobic or, or going back to the pump and treat, focusing on those mobile systems that we can move around. Um, but it's focusing on the areas where the contamination exists because that's where our authority resides moving forward. 
it's not a popular answer, but so it is. the first part of my question is uh -huh. how much input will the community and the RAB sure. okay. have? I did skip over that. Thank you for coming back to that. No, that's that's fair. Um, so traditionally, um, when we do a, a, any of our cleanup sites, uh, the first opportunity and probably the only for the most part is in the proposed plan where we uh, open up the, the, the remedy selection for 30 day public comment. Uh, between recognizing what happened over the last couple of years, recognizing the, the state's process for having public participation, uh, as you've seen, again, it's on the last slide when we finish tonight. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're receiving and welcome to uh, understand and, and hear the concerns and comments on the, uh, the document. Um, you know, I think we would, you know, we'll, we'll uh, listen, adjudicate, adjust, just like we would with the, you know, the DNR folks, where I, you know, have a, you know, if, if you would like, have a, a discussion over what we see the benefits of what maybe be proposed or op options presented versus uh, how we see it fitting into the current problem. Um, so the public's feedback will be considered and ad adjusted and uh, incorporated, I guess is the better way to say it. Um, and then we'll have that dialogue in terms of um, if there's, you know, if it will benefit solving the problem, yeah, we'll, we'll take, on, take on the input. But, you know, but we're not gonna ignore it either. Uh, you know, we're open to having that dialogue to understand what's, uh, what your concerns may be. Okay. You're gonna come back for another question later, I hope. Okay, good, good. Mr. Yeah, Sick, hi. nice to see you. How are you, sir? How are you, you? You're gonna Mr. know the Kelly? answer, so why are you gonna ask me a question you know the answer to already? <laughs> Can you go back to uh, slide 17? 17. Yes, sir. Okay, let's, let's pop over. Yep. Um, after this brief the, oh, sorry. No, no, Mike, he can't turn it up there. It should be on already, Mike. Yeah. After you've uh, taken, uh, taken us through all the alternatives, I wanted to bring you back to this <clears throat> because it's a dilemma that I wrestled with for a long time. And we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. And that is your second bullet in that top portion of your objectives, to protect human health by preventing exposure. What do you determine as the Army as a reasonable time for people to live in fear of their tap water? Living in fear um, was maybe we didn't present it as well as we could have. Um, you know, the state, I think, has a, fair, a very adaptable way of going forward with doing environmental investigations, okay. where it was the preventive action levels and the uh, enforcement standards. You know, Mike, I wasn't involved, you know, well before the 2017 time period, so I, uh, my window of opportunity is a couple years. But, you know, it was more presented as the preventive action levels were creating fear rather than the enforcement standards. And I, if that's incorrect. Why we were going by the preventive action levels was because we mm -hmm. had an infield conditions report mm -hmm. that had ongoing obligations, some of which were to clean up the uh, groundwater contamination based upon those RECRA permits that we had. Those obligations continue, uh, as I understand it, under CERCLA now. Is that correct? Well, it's, it's based on risk. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a obligation to, we had a release to the environment and, and address mm -hmm. those. Uh, but it's a, the, the cleanup process uh, is a, from the applicable or relevant and appropriate, or it's ARARS for short, how we get to our cleanup levels. When we go through that process and it's presented in the report, the cleanup levels are the enforcement standards rather than the preventive action levels. So there is a order of magnitude difference. So we're talking Enforcement standard is the equivalent of a 10 to the minus six PALs or, or a, a 10 to the minus seven. So the infield conditions report we depended upon for the first almost 30 years of this effort mm -hmm. no longer apply. Is that what you're trying to say? And the infield conditions report, and you're, you're right, so put a year to that. 
1992 okay. was when it okay. was, was finalized, so, or, and so it, it was, was amended several right. times. So, so let, me, let me explain what I see of the benefits of the preventive action limits and the enforcement standards. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody go, the Army goes out for the first time, 92, 90s. We, are, we don't know much about the, the groundwater contamination here at Badger. We put in, I managed to break this. Uh, sorry, Joel. Um, okay, there we go, I'm back to, we put, let's, we put in this one well and it exceeds the uh, preventive action levels. Um, let me use a better example. Let's, we, we put it over here. That just tells us we have a potential problem. Well, we don't know whether we're in the center of the plume, the side of the plume. So the preventive action levels, by putting that order of magnitude safety factor into it, says you have a problem, but until you further delineate the problem, the preventive action limits is how you're going to, is the paradigm or the model that you're going to work under. Once you have, here we are from a nature and extent, a remedial investigation, the understanding of the problems and how we would claim success migrates from the, using the preventive action limits or levels to the enforcement standards. Uh, and that would be considered the ARARs and the, the, preventive, uh, the, the enforcement standards uh, are consistent with cleanup levels that we would use across the Army, across okay. the country. Where this, where, where this is going sure. is 30 years or more every single time you put up a remedy. I'd like, who here thinks that's reasonable? I certainly don't, and I don't, and I'm not affected by this contamination. And I, and I hope I, if I w it wasn't my intent to mislead, I, 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 and I hear what you're saying, because, you know, we do that because it's standard within our cleanup guidance in terms of comparing alternatives, but we recognize that just for like my present worth analysis, we understand you come year 31, year 35, or year 55, we're on the, we have an obligation to ensure we're being protective until those enforcement standards are met. Okay. So my last piece of the question goes back to Roger's question. Mm -hmm. Army said it didn't have the authority to isolate the receptor downrange, the, the people that are affected by these plumes, by building the public water system. What is that based on? Was that based on an opinion from OGC? Army? Yeah. Yes. Because that's what the report says. Yes. Did a petition go forward to DOD asking for additional authority? In this case, no. Not Wouldn't that reason. make it feasible if we presented that petition to DOD? I, well, the, it wasn't possible three years ago because we didn't have a risk assessment. You know, we, we hadn't really met our basic obligations under DERP at the time. Um, and what we see even today, uh, we have contaminants. Uh, some of the contaminants are, you know, going even back to the enforcement standards, they're still in that, you know, the, 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 to what extent they're, they're still gonna come back and ask, what are your, what, is that the only alternative? If that was the only alternative, we'd have probably a case. But you know, what we're laying out in the report is there are other alternatives that could be used to address the problem as well. No, I understand, and, they're, and they look like they're, they're similar or greater costs. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where you were going. Somebody else. Jump in here. Okay. Uh, in front of you, uh, have a question? Yes. Right. Yeah, I guess I'll ask. I have a well, quick we'll question. Have another um, opportunity later. <laughs> it's an. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. If, could you go back to slide 15? I guess it is. I'm still a little unclear about when you're developing your risk assessment. Um, some of those plumes you're using uh, total DNT, and the other ones are just using 2.6. And I understand that 2.6 is the main contributor but I still don't understand why you're not using total D&T, especially when the enforcement standard is based on total. Good question. The answer is we, we're actually doing both. In this case, it's a question, and, you'll, and it's, it's a big report, I'll acknowledge that. Uh, Appendix G gets into a little bit more of the details. Uh, if you look at the tables at the back of uh, Appendix G, 
4B, 5B, I think each is like 4A would take the on-site, 4B with off-site. So, I mean, you all will have more interest in the off-site uh, risks that were calculated. Uh, so those are usually going to be the B tables of 4B, 5B, uh, 6B. Um, so one of the we have several challenges, and, and so I'll point out this. So uh, the, the, the two six risk was calculated, and then the total DNT risk was calculated, and we used the higher of those two so that we, um, uh, but it was challenging, I will observe, because the, the minor isomers, the two three, the three four, the three five, do not have cancer slope factors like we do for the two four and the two six. However, the approach that was used uh, incorporates the EPA drinking water uh, risk screening levels. And the, the EPA does have a tap water screening level for total DNT, uh, technical grade DNT. So then you're getting all the, you know, I, I have it written down, you know, the, the technical grade DNT is, uh, well, like I said earlier, it's 95%, 2, 4, and 2, 6, and then the other 5% is the other three. Well. They did the studies, and, and because it's a mixture, it's not quite as toxic as the 2.6 DNT. 2.6 is going to be the most toxic. 2.4 is higher, and then the technical grade is kind of in the middle of, the, of okay. each of those. So the bottom line, quite, we, we did look at both, and they're, they're, what we used as the driver for each of these was based on the worst case scenario. All right, thanks. I have one other quick question. When you're talking about the EVO, um, I was curious, what's the rate of groundwater movement in those areas? You know, you're proposing different time frames, two years. You're, you're right. Actually, How fast a, is the water moving in those areas? Uh, so here, um, here is th you can see uh, for the propellant burning ground, 306 feet per year. I'm going to break Lee's rule, and sir, you guys kind of came in both at the same time, so go ahead. I have a quick question about liability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question that the Department Army and the contractors created this problem when they started mm -hmm. dumping the, the, their contaminants into the ground and they were going into the groundwater. And it seems to me that, that, that the government shares a responsibility to deal with that problem. They're not dealing with the problem effectively. You're not spending a lot of money at it. What, and I've been involved in three lawsuits against the government and prevailed in, in them. And it's really beyond anything you can. But that, that, do you see the courts as any kind of way to get leverage to make the Department of Army responsible and the DNR responsible for what they've created? and what they've done to the people here. And, you know, families that have cancer and have had health problems, I mean, you have a responsibility there, not you, but I'm saying in a generic, you know, governmental sense. But some, something's gotta be done, and maybe, maybe the courts is the only way to do it. And I don't know if that's the answer. I, I don't expect you to answer that, but. As, well, as a federal a employee, you put me in an awkward position do. trying to answer that question, so I will pass if that's okay. We, but I will offer this. We, we, we recognize we do have, the liability is on the Army. You know, you mentioned DNR. The, their responsibility is to hold us accountable, to make sure we're doing the work consistent with the laws uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and, and what we're trying to show tonight and through our continuing dialogue is that what we're doing is consistent with what we're doing across the program. Uh, recognizing the authorities that we have, um, but I will. Uh, I know we had another question, but I will. We're gonna. We'll do. How am I doing on time? Let me run through. There's gonna be a lot of sir. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I've got a question on the EVO, oh. and it it boils down to the timing. You indicated that uh, there are still a number of questions that are unanswered with respect to using that alternative with respect to DNT. What is the time frame that you expect to have answers back on some of those variables that you don't know? And does it fit in with the time frame for making a decision on this within the next six to 12 months so that you can reasonably consider alternative four as a viable option. 
let me start, and I'm going to use the opportunity to phone a friend as well. But the, uh, the first start would be there's enough experience with the technology at other locations that if it makes sense based on the balancing of the alternatives, we would select it. Uh, but from a timing perspective, uh, there is work to be done there, you know, after the, uh, as we start to implement the remedy, uh, do some pilot studies and things of that nature to better refine the application. So we, we don't have to have the final answer in order to select the remedy, uh, if that's going to be part of the a component to the remedy. There's enough experience with it elsewhere in similar applications where it has been successful. Um, and I think one of the, th you know, some of the changes Randy had mentioned earlier, you know, whether it's the Evo or the corn syrup or their, you know, the approach is going to be consistent. The substrate that you're pushing into the groundwater to help promote that growth, you know, we may tweak. Team, any uh, additional things you want to provide? If that alternative was selected, when we did the design, we would do a treatability study, refine how far apart we would want injection points, what the exact material was, and how it would react specifically in this geology. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I still am confused about how you would uh, select that without knowing the, the true effectiveness of it because well, I did a quick search on Google last night and a number of studies popped up and most of them were less than 100 feet deep and it uh, looked like the standard radius of effectiveness was about 25 feet from each well so uh, you would have to have a pretty intense array of wells in order to apply this and I didn't see that it had been done with DNT nor at great depths. And, and I, what I would ask is, um, for the sake of time, you're, you're going to see a little bit of difference in our next section of the presentation, and it goes in part to, I think, the answer or the question that you're asking right now. Uh, what you'll see in terms of the, the, the proposal of the, was it the, the term burning ground or the central plume that we have a more dense uh, network for the uh, anaerobic, the number of push points? Both. Both? Okay, yeah. One was even, I think it, what did we have here? Uh, doesn't necessarily say the uh, uh, what you'll see for the next two plumes is much more, uh, much number of temporary points that would be installed, and it goes to based on what we see of the geology to address some of those uh, real life experiences. Uh, and to the earlier uh, gentleman's question about you know the flow of ground groundwater flow rates, all that function in, factor into it. In some cases, it's just a question of the spacing between the injection points. Maybe you need them, you know, if it's slower moving, maybe you can do a wider spacing, you know, and so those variables get taken care of or into consideration as part of the design. The Mike, can you talk about the timing as far as, okay, we'll, we're having this public comment period, and then after that, we respond to the comments, and then we issue a final report, and then we have the proposed plan, and then we have the record of decision, and then we go into the remedial design so that people understand the length of time to get from here to where that treatability study actually might occur. Right, and I, you know, I have the process, and we've shown it in the previous meetings. Uh, it's a backup slide, but at the risk of giving away the movie of what I'm gonna present next, I'll come back to that as well if that's okay. Very good. So that was the propellant burning ground. One down, three, two to go. The, uh, so just laying out the history, uh, waste disposal pits, uh, landfills, uh, unlike, the deter uh, unlike the propellant burning ground, we historically have not had any active treatment. Um, the, this, the source areas, uh, when I say we didn't have any active treatment, to, to put them, better perspective for the groundwater. Uh, it's all been monitoring so far. Uh, we, we did have the, uh, you know, some examples here where we did the clay bear, uh, for each of the landfills, uh, a landfill cover system, the intent would be to reduce infiltration, therefore uh, minimizing the contaminant release to the groundwater. Um, similar type process as presented earlier. Uh, the RIs focusing on the, uh, nature and extent, what's our left and right, and how deep is it going forward. Um, 
uh, and then where the data tells us, um, uh, we did have an occasion here in 2019 uh, where the well, uh, where was it, right up in here? Where is our well? Right there. Yep. Uh, the well was replaced. Um, and as you can see, it, it's right there, right beyond the, the toe of the land, uh, the toe of the plume is, is drawn right there. Um, some of the contaminants that we evaluated and uh, in some cases, you know, no longer consider. Uh, sulfates, uh, we see uh, oftentimes, uh, but over time, uh, in terms of the sampling, uh, this was discontinued. Uh, but we did look at it, um, in this case, a uh, fairly isolated area, unlike some of the other plumes that you've seen tonight. Um, so uh, trichloroethane. Um, so without getting too much into the chemistry, the, the TCE, which I said we have each of the, you know, throughout the Army, uh, the TCA oftentimes is one of the breakdown products or associated, uh, another solvent, a little bit less toxic. Uh, so it's sometimes, it's often not surprising at our Army sites that we see the 112 uh, TCA. Um, and it's just how the chemistry of the, of the, the materials put together. Um, TCE, once again, just like uh, plume, we we're seeing this across a uh, couple things unique. Um, more study will be done in the, in the coming months, uh, but there's some questions about whether the TCE uh, originating from the uh, deterrent burning ground is related to the past Army activities or uh, an anomaly or some other site. So uh, we'll be working with DNR to, to do more sampling and, and potential delineation to identify uh, whether that's an Army responsibility. Similar to the propellant burning ground, your conceptual site model, you know, understanding how deep groundwater is, what the geology is, you know, that, you know, this kind of pictorial understanding goes to many of the questions that was asked earlier tonight in terms of the, uh, you know, the well spacing, uh, the, the pump and treats pulling the water out. So depending on the, the geology, you know, are we going to be successful with a pump and treat uh, versus pushing it in with the anaerobic uh, degradation type approach? Uh, similar type. Uh, I only include that risk table once. Um, if we need to, we can go back to it. But it, it does highlight the. Uh, uh, these are the three, uh, and, and just as I noted in the question in the the, the first question session. Um, we ran it for both total DNT for the risk and the 2.6. And in this case, uh, there was levels of the, the minor isomers, the 2.3 and the 3.5 uh, in one of the samples. Um, the other thing it is important to understand or for me to present, uh, when we did the risk assessment, we worked to be as conservative as possible. So we took the, the maximum concentration over the course of, of several years. Um, and uh, so that the, the sample that was used to drive the, the two six or the total DNT that did include uh, the, the the minor isomers the two three and the, the three five were a big part of that driving the risk. So the risk there was still there was two six in the sample, but when you add those other minor isomers and the way the calculation worked, the two the total DNT became the the risk driver for this area. Similar uh, suite of alternatives. Um, our throwaway alternative required in the analysis, moderate to natural attenuation, uh, used in our prior uh, analysis and, and still carried forward for this uh, report. Uh, the pump and treat, uh, looking at opportunities, uh, three extraction wells initially paired up with three mobile treatment systems. So an extraction well here, down gradient, down gradient, trying to capture uh, the plume as it moves forward with the intent of, uh, well, finally getting off of 30 years. Whether it happens or not is still an estimate, but the idea is a trade-off of, of more active treatment with the intent of achieving cleanup at a, at a, in a shorter time period. But then again, coming up with a, a slightly higher cost. So there's a balancing act that goes there. Uh, this goes to the question earlier, depending on uh, what you see here uh, in terms of the alternative for the anaerobic biodegradation. Uh, in this case, 406 uh, temporary locations, uh, you know, based on the teams looking at this, 
uh, whether it's the ground, the hydrogeologic conditions, uh, the soil types, uh, many more uh, temporary lines here as compared to the previous plume. And then uh, the, the spacing uh, also is, is closer together. Um, oops. Uh, well replacement, that's part of each of these as necessary. Um, and then the compare and contrast of alternative four and six, rather than having the, uh, so, uh, the, the, the anaerobic injections throughout the plume, focusing on uh, just the higher concentrations. Uh, in this case, it would be the, the higher total DNT concentrations greater than uh, one uh, part per billion there. Okay, as promised, for the questions that weren't answered in the first round. Um, Lee, I did good for getting through those slides. Questions. More questions? Yes, ma'am. You talked about the groundwater enforcement standards mm -hmm. that are based on protection of public health and it's protected as a drinking water source and based on cancer risk for carcinogens, the 10 to the minus six. And there was a lot of discussion about on-site, off-site. Do you intend to pursue compliance with enforcement standards, both on-site and off-site? We do. Okay. Then but recognizing when we're talking risk that the, um, I read your article the other day, by the way, the, uh, in, in the Madison Times. Then it did its job. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I, I will offer that from the perspective. I, I think I understand where you're going. But, the, you know, and that's where it, you know, it was important to kind of lay that baseline of when we're talking about risk, it is the source, pathway, and receptor. And the dynamics of those three components is different on-site versus off-site. Uh, but recognizing that while migration has occurred, you know, we, we do feel like we have good control over, uh, in, in for the most part, of, of how the plumes are reacting. Uh, obviously, in the last two years, there's been some hiccups with, for a variety of reasons, with some spikes. But uh, uh, the monitoring is necessary to continue to understand contaminant plume migration as well. We'll continue. Right. So you're aware that groundwater is protected as a, re as a drinking water resource, whether or not it's being actively used for drinking water at that moment. Correct. Okay. On the PFAS, I remembered what I wanted so to say. It, what? And I don't, I don't, I, so I, I will offer a, the remedial time frame to get to that objective could vary. I understand. Okay, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that is, oh, for I'm me sorry. that's important clarification. I'm trying to be quick so I don't take up no, too that's much okay. time. Uh, just a point of clarification, you talked about technical grade DNT and how mm -hmm. it's high percentage of certain isomer. In the environment at Badger, it's the reverse. At the deterrent burning ground, it's very little of the, the more predominant P, uh, the 2,4 and the 2,6 DNT. And the lesser isomers are in higher concentrations. So just, just to comment. And on the PFAS, the thing I neglected to say before, is you need to look at the deterrent burning ground. There's three burn pits there, as you just discussed. At Fort McCoy, all the PFAS is coming from their burn pits. <laughs> and also, the propellant burning ground is a lot older. I wouldn't expect it to find it there. I'd be more, well, it could be there, but it's more likely to be at the deterrent burning grounds because that's 1970s, 1980s. And, and, and these guys know this. Uh, so the, you're, you're saying the deterrent burning ground is the older one or the newer one? The newer one. Okay, thank you. That's just for my benefit. Thanks. So I think, am I on? Oh, no, I am on. Yep, okay. Um, it was, in my experience, uh, not particular, I don't have the particulars for the deterrent burning ground at Badger. I'll defer that to Joel. But um, a lot of times when you have burning grounds at army ammunition plants. They're burning things to burn them. It's not necessarily a fire training area that they would have sprayed foam or those types of things. So I am familiar with the situation at Fort McCoy and those particular burn pits are actually fire training burn pits where they're actively, they were actively spraying the foam and training with it and things like that. Whereas, and Joel, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, the, the burning grounds may be because 
Uh, it's Army practice that anything that has been in contact with explosives cannot be uh, just sent to a landfill. It has to actually be burned. And so I don't, if you want to speak a little bit more of that. So I'm not sure that the deterrent burning ground should be an area that we would look for. So, so based on the um, Olin SOPs for burning procedures, the official way they did it was the buggy would come in with the deterrent into the deterrent burning ground area. They would dispose of that honey wagon into the pit and they would provide something that would keep it aflame. They would, this sounds weird, they would run a little trail of it out away so it was safe to light the trail to the pit and they would leave. They would not necessarily stay at the location and the, the security and fire crew would come back to make sure so they did not stay there while it was burning. So this is the practice even during the Vietnam time. So they weren't concerned about it getting away because they weren't even monitoring it 24 hours a day. So they would leave it there burning all night. So I don't know if, I don't have any, if there was firefighting foam, but I just know that they weren't concerned about it getting out of control not sure if that was good or bad, but uh, that's what I've read in the SOP. The question was then why focus on the settling ponds, for example, because there was no fire training there. Uh, the settling ponds were downgrading of the sludge drying beds. And so we were looking not necessarily from a foam perspective, but what could have been in those sludges that may or may not contain PFAS. Uh, I didn't realize that, thank you. No problem. Great. Questions? Yes, ma'am. In other Army cleanup sites, which of the um, EVO treatments work better? The ones that are just at the source area or those that go throughout the plume? Okay, go ahead, Linda. In general, it works better when we treat the entire plume, and that's why you see the difference in cleanup time. If we're treating only at the source area, the rest of the plume is continuing to migrate. The only reason that we proposed it is that's where our highest areas are. Okay, and then along those lines, I know that the DNR has closed soil remedial actions, but will there ever be any consideration of additional soil cleanup at the contamination sources? Well, it would, is there a specific area of, of concern? Well, it, the source of all the plumes. Because, well, you know, the con, what I'm seeing is that most of the contamination is near the source. Right. And that's okay. where you're concentrating. And if the water is moving so many feet per year, and yet the, the source is still the area where most of the contamination is, that makes me think um, that perhaps we haven't done a real good job getting the contamination out of the soil. That's just my late person. And I, I asked for clarification solely, so I didn't. Yeah, make sure I, it's I'm a thinking of the, the caps in particular at the deterrent yeah. burning ground and the propellant burning grounds. Yeah, um, there are so, several areas where there's the deeper contamination that where we saw where the water levels coming up, but that was based on as far as we could get down. Correct. I mean, clarification help here, guys. Uh, what's your thoughts? I mean, we, we went to the depth that was reasonably achievable at that point in time. Uh, if there's that deeper contamination, because we, we, the models suggest with the rising groundwater levels, they're encountering potentially soils that are contaminated and then leaching out. Um, but is, how feasible is it to get to those uh, and identify, uh, you know, because once again, you're pushing it down. You know, if you're doing the anaerobic, you're, you're, you're trying to get it to the right place at the right time so it can do its thing. Um, so with, with the soils and the, the anaerobic, it has I mean, some of that options. Uh, the soil vapor extraction would be more of an anaerobic, um, but there are some options for anaerobic. Any thoughts here? So, uh, uh, Michelle, yes, uh, good question. And I would probably say normally, yes, we would be looking at trying to remove the, uh, the soils in that beta zone above the 
groundwater table. The challenge we have here at Badger is the depth. Um, it's really deep and, uh, and it's a pretty large area. The concentrations based on the chemical data isn't, isn't that high, but it's high enough to cause an issue for the groundwater. So I think that's one of the reasons why in these alternatives we wanted to look at source control again, because it sort of goes back to that one chart. We did have a high water table back in 2008, 2009. Uh, 2008, 2009, but it was controlled by the treatment system that was present there at the time. So that was part of the reason we wanted to go look at uh, more source control type activities. So um, um, if we didn't do that, um, uh, I'm not sure the, the caps themselves long term will be effective. Uh, but if we can couple it with some source control, um, then I think that's a good way to keep it, you know, from migrating, keep it in place. Um, the short of it is uh, trying to dig, and I think that's what a nine-acre uh, surface impoundment. Yeah, and we're and the, when I looked at the chemical data, it was pretty much consistent all the way down to the water table. Uh, wasn't really any high spike zones because I was sort of looking, you know, is there areas that we could go in and maybe get the the larger masses out, and we really didn't have it. It's pretty pretty spread evenly, and the cost of that would be quite quite extensive, um, and it would take time. Um, the other concern I have from uh, engineering perspective, I think we would probably make it the problem worse, and because we would have to remove the cap open it to rainwater, and we would flush the system before we could get it dug up. So we would have that problem if we actually took the action. So, um, and I'm not sure how we would mitigate it. In fact, I think Mike brought that up at one point. Yeah, because we would be strip mining it. We'd have to slope it so far back so we wouldn't have cave-in issues. And then every time it rained, we'd be flushing more contaminant down gradient um, that I'm, I'm just not sure that would really be feasible so um, but that's why we wanted the we were looking at the pump and treat close to uh, looking at the EVO options close to and uh, and I think you know one of those coupled with continued maintenance of the caps I think will control those sources uh, both short term and long term so. okay. well thank you Randy In the back. So from some emails that I saw before the meeting, um, the USGS representative is here who is providing technical support to the RAB, is that correct? Who, who is that? Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I guess uh, as a RAB member, uh, where do we as a RAB go from here? Do we meet privately? I mean, it seems like every time we have a meeting, it's at the direction of the Army, and we follow the Army's agenda, and we really don't get a chance to really provide the input that we get from our community members. I, I've been up here for almost two hours, no, hour and a half. I, I, we can go if you guys want a little time. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no. I wanted to let you know that uh, we, we've just been in contact with the USGS um, people. They've not had time really to read the report, so they wanted to come up here and observe. But we will have our own time, and they'll set up our own meeting. So please take the time to meet the gentleman um, after the meeting if you have time there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the, the intent is that he's providing guidance to the, the RAB. Without the Army's presence. Yes. Uh, we anticipate the comment period going longer. Um, we're not exactly sure when. Uh, WDNR has asked us to make it 60 days after we submit the PASI for PFAS. We have not submitted that final report yet. So after we submit that, there will be 
60 days after that, which gives plenty of time for the RIFS to get reviewed. And so when we do submit it, we will send out a Dear Neighbors letter providing you the link to the PASI and giving you the new end of the comment period. But right now we don't know exactly what that new end of the comment period will be. We just know it will be extended. Basically, um, it'll be no earlier than probably about the 14th or 15th of uh, February. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, again, uh, subject to submission of uh, the PFAS report to uh, uh, WDNR. So um, one of the things I will say, yeah, this is your opportunity. And I, and I captured some really good, uh, some comments uh, regarding the EVO and treatability studies and so forth. So we got some homework, I think, to do to, to, to help um, provide some additional information on that alternative to you. Um, and again, uh, this is an opportunity for you to capture your comments, um, submit them to us. Um, you know, this draft is one opportunity to pro provide us feedback. Um, there will be another session later on as we get to down selecting into a preferred alternative. So there'll be another public comment period, uh, uh, which typically goes 45 days. 30 to 45. Yeah, 30 to. Normally, uh, we do the upper bounds. We normally do 45, not the 30 days. So, uh, uh, so there'll be another opportunity there. Um, and so please uh, take this time. Uh, USGS is there as a resource. Um, and plus, if you all have questions back to us, you really don't have to wait till official comments. I mean, I'm not opposed to taking some initial comments and uh, working back and forth with you as we go forward. So uh, uh, a lot of stuff. This is like, I mean, this is one of the bigger RIFS as I've seen, I've been personally involved with. So there's a lot of options uh, sort of replicated because of the number of groundwater units that we have. Um, so uh, please take the time, digest it. Don't, you know, don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. <coughs> Being a novice here, is there a key to all these initials that you're throwing around? People saying NABCD or DNAT or BDCSI or whatever. I have no idea what you're talking about. There's a, actually a website called Acronym Finder. Uh, I use it all the time. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm not a geek, so I have no idea how to do that, but it's really frustrating to sit here and have people yelling initials when I have no idea at all what they're talking about. We, we I, are guilty of that, so we, I, I'll apologize for the group because uh, it is what we do on a regular basis. And that's, you know, in many cases, I try to say vegetable oil rather than Evo and things like that. Uh, um, but no, well taken. Uh, is there anyone in particular that you can think of that we can clarify? Way over my head. All right, well. But, and I understood he was coming and I, until you guys pointed him out that representative from USGS, welcome. Uh, but he's here for you guys to understand. I mean, he'll do more than just identify acronyms, obviously, but uh, those are the kind of things we can help out. He can help out with as well. Okay, last leg of this journey. Uh, central plume. Uh, so was there any more questions before I move on? Uh, we'll, we'll do one more round after this. Um, so central plume, similar, you know, the, another iteration. Uh, a few distinctions to point out. Um, the, we, we did have production wastewater, which was discharged to open ditches, which leads one to believe that's, that's a potential problem moving forward. Uh, but the analysis that's been done uh, unlike the other areas where we had burning pits, uh, uh, landfills and things of that nature, we don't necessarily have 
uh, the specific uh, source areas in the, the central plume that we had in the, the previous two plume areas. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have a problem. That just means it becomes a little bit more challenging in terms of how we're going to address the problem. Um, there were a number of uh, sewer lines. Uh, as sewer lines age, um, it's oftentimes we're worried about uh, infiltrate, what we call infiltration, where groundwater is coming into the sewer lines. You can also have exfiltration, where the production waste or leak going out through cracks, breaks in the pipe, and getting released into the soil and then making its way to the groundwater. Often, uh, so uh, we did have the soil and, and sewer removal projects uh, that were undertaken. Um, and, and both the, the soil and the sewer piping disposed in a, an a approved landfill. Um, so we went through, as part of the RI step, nature and extent. Um, DNT, uh, in this case, uh, it's the, uh, the, the two six, when we did the two, both, both risk assessments, uh, it was mainly the two six was driving the actions here. Um, Benzene was detected in uh, 2017, uh, so the risk assessment was run. As I mentioned earlier, we tried to take as a conservative approach as possible, so we took the maximum value that was detect detected over uh, any of the past sampling activities. Uh, but since that June 2017, uh, we have not found uh, benzene in any of the, the central plume wells. Can I get some value? Is that correct? That is correct, right? That is correct. I don't, that want, to, was, I don't and, want to oversell this. And, so. and Mike, that was in a monitoring well. Okay, thank you. An on-site monitoring well? No. Okay, very good. Uh, but, you know, it, it, if we continue to do our monitoring, we continue to evaluate the problem. Uh, but uh, the, as written and currently, benzene is not considered a, uh, in this case, a, a, a COC uh, warranting the, uh, future action. Um, we also had some, while there was some risk drivers uh, related to both chloroform and 1,2-dichloroethane, uh, similar to the 1,1,2-trichloroethane. Uh, the 1,1,2, the tri tells you three. In this case, it's the, the dye is there's, there's two of the ethanes uh, uh, tagged on there, or the chloros uh, tagged onto the ethane chain. Um, but the maximum concentration that we detected over the past years was all less than what would be a, a, a the cleanup standard. In this case, it was the 140 enforcement standard. So uh, the, the risk assessment tells us we have a problem. Once we start to analyze that problem, how we're going to address it, we look to how we monitor or measure success. The measuring of success is the 140 enforcement standards. And at least for these two contaminants, uh, we're already there. So what ends up happening is for the, the, the central plume, it's going to be more a focus on the, the 2,6-D and T as the contaminant of concern as we move forward as our, our remedy selection. Uh, similar conceptual site model, each of them vary uh, in terms of the soils and geology, uh, once again impacting uh, how we design some of these things. Um, fairly repetitive, uh, similar no vapor intrusion, uh, drinking water. Um, Similar in, in, in scope of what you saw in the first two rounds with the propellant burning ground and the, the, the deterrent burning ground, uh, the difference in this case, you don't see an alternative six. And, and that goes back to the earlier kickoff slide for this uh, plume that we don't have a, a source area like a landfill, uh, uh, you know, something definitive that we can do the source area treatment. So uh, alternative four is focusing on the, the larger plume uh, and so for this one, there really isn't a, a particular source area. Uh, no action or throwaway alternative, monitor natural attenuation, all these, they'll likely be a component uh, similar to the question earlier about, especially on site, um, where a remedial time, an acceptable, re a longer remedial time frame would be acceptable. Um, pump and treat. Um, as conceptualized in the feasibility study, using a series of extraction, eight mobile extraction wells at various locations in the plume, suck out the contaminants, treat them, discharge them, uh, find a discharge point or an outfall that would go back to the Wisconsin River. Uh, the benefits perceived in our, the current analysis, 
uh, reducing our sampling and monitoring period and our cleanup time period. So much like all the active treatment alternatives, it, there's, uh, there's a trade-off, okay, higher cost, potentially shorter cleanup times. How do those combinations work as, as we go forward? Um, so this is the, this is the third, uh, the, the, the term burning ground, we were at roughly, I think 406 was what was contemplated currently. And, and this goes back to the earlier question in terms of, you know, based on what we know of the plume, you know, many more treatment lines, 38 treatment lines going up and down throughout the plume, 98 temporary locations where we're injecting uh, the vegetable oil uh, with the intent of, of driving down the, the 2,6 uh, DNT concentrations. Uh, all goes well, looking at a fairly uh, quick time period, obviously then the, uh, uh, the, the, the higher cost that comes along with that. Uh, well replacement, part of the, the toolbox for each of the alternatives. Um, and, and that's it. Um, this was set up to model what we initially released. It doesn't reflect the extension uh, being uh, provided. So, Kathy, what is our new end date on this? We, we don't have it yet. As soon as we give the report with PASI to the WDNR, we'll have 60 days to that. That would be the new end. Okay, very good. Very good. So, very similar, similar topics, similar material being presented. Um, questions that I can answer? Yes, sir. Yes. I'm just using slide 47 as an example here. Um, because I, I, I think even though it's kind of a worst case scenario, I want to make a point here. When you look at the wells that are the red dots at the bottom there on the north side of Groover's Grove Bay, and you see that plume coming down there, um, that creates a situation, and, and most of those are, I, I believe, annually sampled. I think that's what the red dot means. So my first question is, to what extent or did the Army factor in the periodicity of sampling into the risk analysis? Because in theory, you know, five days after you took your last sample, they may have a contaminated well and not know it for the next year until the next sampling cycle comes around. So has the sampling cycle been factored into the risk analysis? Well, it, it is, and by taking the following approach, uh, we've sampled annually, uh, well, varying frequencies for varying locations. So when we did the risk analysis, we used the highest concentration ever detected in the plume over the period of the 30 years. Right. And well, more, more recently, it was focused the last couple of years rather than 30 years. Um, so. So, for take, tell me wrong so take, for instance, the central plume there in Water's Edge. There were four years that were used in the risk assessment. But it was the highest of the over the last it was the, the highest for any contaminant for those four years. And so when you blend the contaminants together, benzene was the highest concentration. 2,6-DNT didn't have to be the same well or the same time frame but that was used in the calculation. So it is the worst case for any contaminant in the plume for any time during the four years. And you know, what, there, there is a lot of data to over the, whether it's annual, semi-annual, or even that period of time. There, there's opportunities on sites like this to take a mean average, you know, st apply some statistics to, to say what is the average concentration in a plume over time. We chose not to do that. We chose the, we used the maximum. Uh, to be, uh, once again, to, to intent to be as, as conservative as possible. Okay, so what I'm hearing is it, it took a statistically generic approach. No, we, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't want to mislead. We, that, what, that, would, that could have been an option, but we chose not to. We chose to do a more conservative approach, taking the last four years of data 
and regardless of which well or which contaminant, so the, the benzene could have been in one location, the 2,6 in another location, but when we said, what is the representative sample through that whole plume, we used the maximum concentration or the highest concentration detected with the intent of not trying to use averaging or statistics to tell a story that it, it would not be, you know, so it, it's, the intent was to show more of a worst case scenario. Well, I guess my point is, is when you look at the numbers that you put up on the, one of the previous graphs, uh, it would indicate that the risk there offsite for uh, cancer is, I believe it was four times 10 to the negative fifth, which is, means four chances per 100,000, or 0.04 people per the, you know, so if you're in the town of Merrimack where there's less than a total of 1,000 people, you're supposed to feel pretty good. However, if I was in the horseshoe living in Water's Edge, I would not feel so good because it's kind of surrounding me. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of sitting there waiting for the cavalry to show up. Um, and thinking about that and the last three years since the Army has said they did not have the authority to do a municipal well system, which would have holistically address the issue, I would suggest that the Army consider another alternative or modifying alternative five as such. Any time that you have residential wells that are either directly adjacent to or directly in the path of a plume and are exceeding the, the PAL uh, requirements, that you replace that well. I think that would go a long ways to addressing a lot of the concerns that the community has. Because these people that live in those houses, even though they're not from a regulatory standpoint required to have their well replaced, they are still being impacted. The majority of those people are buying their own drinking water and when they go to sell their house, they are, are having a hard time selling it. And I know that from personal experience and, and, and having been a realtor, and I talked with several realtors in the last few days, and there's been at least three or four um, houses in the last couple of years in Water's Edge that the deals fell through because of, of the water exceedances. They, those are the PAL exceedances. And that just gets to, you know, the human spirit and, and how people feel about things when they're, they have choices to make. So these people are being impacted, maybe not at a regulatory level, but they are being impacted. So. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Question. Actually, he's coming back with the microphone. My question is, I'm just wondering when it says off-site and on-site cancer risks, um, what are those specific cancer risks? What have you identified to this point? And what non-cancer risk have you identified? That's a good question. Um, and it's buried in the report. I'd have to go back and look at it. So, when, when, so let's take... DNT, for example, um, uh, you know the, the studies that they do. Um, uh, there, there's not too many. You know, un unlike PFAS, there's national interest in terms of you know exposure to the PFAS constituents. So EPA has taken it on as doing a lot of the toxicity studies to better understand uh, the dose and the impact to a receptor. And, and the, the way where our science is today. Uh, in this case, we often do, we're not going to do studies on people, we do it on rats. Uh, so when they, the studies that were done, and, and when it comes to DNT, there's, there's very few studies, there's a handful of them, because uh, it, it's a military unique contaminant rather than a national issue. So it's not an EPA's top priority to, to do the tox studies. So what you're going to see, if, if you go look at the toxicity studies that are out there in the literature, the Army's been involved with a lot of those because it is uh, in our best interest to it, it advance the science 
uh, and when we do this, we don't do it in a vacuum. We do it with, with EPA's oversight, but uh, from a resourcing perspective, it's a lot, you know, we, it's in our best interest to try to understand it. But so these are, in some cases, rats over a two-year study being dosed, they're high cost, and when they, but when they do the analysis, they will look to see, get, try to get into what kind of cancers would be created. Or in the case of 2.4 and 2.6, EPA is de determined based on the toxicity data that there are potential carcinogens. Um, and so we, we move out with that approach, uh, but then buried in the literature for each of these, uh, depending on the contaminant, there are different types of uh, adverse effects. And uh, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, are, and we can work are to Are you to seeing get that. higher breast cancer? Are you seeing higher MS? Um, these are some of the things I feel I see in the community. Well, I'm just wondering yeah. what the toxicology shows. We, the, the, the toxicology would suggest exposure to certain kind of contaminants will uh, create or have the potential to, for certain types of cancers. It won't say that that's what's going to occur. Um, you know, for example, uh, years ago for the Army, perchlorate was the uh, uh, one of the, because it's used in rocket fuel, uh, one of the, so that's a, a hazard index and non-cancer. Exposure to perchlorate uh, affected the, the thyroid. So, uh, you know, that was the adverse effect. So each of the contaminants, uh, and we'd have to go back and look at, you guys want to opine? Um, to answer your question, um, I talked to the risk assessment team and we can put a link to some of that information on the website where you can go to get some of that other Toxicology information. Well, that, yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. yeah. So, so EPA has a real nice website. It's Iris, and so they'll have that information for each of the chemicals that we evaluated in the risk assessment. They'll tell you what the form of cancer was that we based the risk on, as well as any of the non-cancer effects, like if there was breast cancer or anything that doesn't come up typically on any of the contaminants that we're talking about here, but they have a really nice, pretty easily accessible website where you can find that information. So it's a very specific form of cancer for each of the contaminants that are carcinogens, and then they have a specific effect that they evaluate, and sometimes the effect is, you know, something like a stomach ache. You know, it's not anything too really severe. Other times it's, you know, like um, cirrhosis of the liver. But all that information is easily accessible. And like Joel said, we could put a link together for that. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Iris, I-R-I-S. At one point, I think it was epa.gov front slash iris, but they may have moved it, I don't know. But thank you, that's a great, you know, that's the resource we're looking for. I have um, two unrelated questions. So the monitored natural attenuation, as I understand, is um, a passive activity. It's not active or proactive, it's just Monitoring, literally monitoring. We're letting Mother Nature do its trick. Right, okay. So that's what's been, that's ongoing no matter what. Yeah. So it's not really a remediation, it's just watch and see what takes place out there. Well, and, and from a practical perspective, we've learned in certain sites, uh, if taking a more aggressive or active remedy, you think of as a bigger hammer, sometimes taking a bigger hammer to a problem doesn't help you anymore. Uh, it's not always the case. I don't want. I mean, I'm not going to paint it with one broad brush. But the idea with with monitor natural attenuation, monitor natural attenuation, is that a bigger hammer is not going to oftentimes solve the problem. Mother Nature's got it, and, and some of those, um, you know, depending on the contaminant. If if we were talking about metals contamination, for example, we wouldn't be having the monitored natural attenuation discussion because those aren't can do that from a natural perspective. They're not going to break down. Uh, but the coordinated solvents and the, the, the DNTs, we have studies that do show that they break down over time. Thank you. And the second question is, um, where are the estimated costs uh, come from? Are those actual costs? Were those actions to be taken? Um, 
are those bid out? Are they based on uh, a number of different contractors saying we would like to do this and this is what it would cost? Or how are those costs um, arrived at? And especially if, if you look at Central Plume, $23 million to uh, pump uh, Wesson oil into the ground seems pretty expensive to me, but that sounds like a lot of oil. Um, a lot of uh, cooking oil pumped into the ground, but... Brian, you can answer this, I hope. Just curious. <laughs> so uh, I can address your question. Um, for the cost estimates, we used a variety of sources. Uh, some of the things uh, that you see that were incorporated into the costs came directly from uh, contractors that uh, we had contacted. Other things were uh, best engineering judgments. So. Um, the numbers that you see are real. So a lot of the costs associated with um, the EVO, for instance, has to do with the, the sheer number of direct push injections. Um, a lot of those areas, you're talking about injecting that product in several different levels. So when you do a well or direct push for several hundred feet, you have a well, you have a a drill rig running on that for, you know, very many, a large number of days, many rigs. Um, all of these costs also include uh, for, for the alternatives that have a long-term O&M or maintenance or monitoring cost, all of that is included as well. So to go out and sample, you know, hundreds of wells for 30 years, sometimes at the frequency of um, every quarter, uh, that, that cost adds up. So. Uh, the numbers were just, um, there was a lot of uh, research and uh, research phone calls and compu computations that were done to make sure that those costs could be as accurate as possible based on the design concepts that are presented here today. He did a much better job answering that question than I would have. Yes, sir. So under the MNA uh, solution, you would still do uh, residential monitoring? Yes. You would, and well replacement if one would show? That is correct, yes. That's what's currently laid out in that, that remedy. Okay. But how about the other homes that aren't necessarily right in the plume? Like Mr. Hansen said, those homes at Water's Edge are like in the bullseye, but you know, other ones up the lake a little ways, are, are we done monitoring those or do we have to ask for it or what? Well, we didn't talk about it in, in, term, in advance of this meeting, but uh, you know, from the past meetings that we've had, uh, there, there was similar concern expressed by the community that you know, over time we've kind of too narrowly focused in on what we see as the, the problem areas. And within the last year we went and took to, we did our one time we, we kind of revisited, uh, and that did show some areas that are requiring adjustments. Uh, but that's the, the the gentleman from USGS is here tonight as a, as a member of your support. But I know you've you've heard that the, there's another part of their organization that is looking at the um, uh, you know optimize. Do we have the right monitoring wells in the right locations? Um, and then, you know, for the level of cost, the, the changes that would occur from that report or that output, we, we don't see that necessarily changing the remedy selection. We see it similar to the questions that, or the, the discussion we had earlier tonight. Uh, if anaerobic degradation was treated, you know, the, the frequency or, or distance spacing of the injection wells may change. I think if M&A was a part of any component, I will not, I think, I, you know, I know that the results of the, the uh, USGS study looking at that, that would be all worked into it. So if there's areas that are not adequately being addressed uh, and their study suggests we should, you know, we'll make those adjustments going forward. Thanks. But Thanks also, just to clarify that, every year, approximately every year, we discuss the monitoring program with WDNR and refine where we're monitoring. So it's not locked in stone, and as we see changes in plumes, we would address where we are sampling. Uh, I hate to be a 
sour puss on this, but I think you're doing a good job with the limited budget you have, but it seems to me that it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars more to really mediate this, this problem. It's not going to be done with the few million dollars you're spending. If you look at some of the other big toxic site removals, they're talking about millions, billions of dollars. So I think you're doing a good job there, but you know, I, from my, I don't live here, but for, from where I sit, it seems to me that the community is a term that they use is collateral damage because they're suffering. And I, I don't see an answer. I don't see the government coming up with an answer. You know, that's my Okay. I have a simple question. It, the wells that you replace, just by going going deeper, is that the remedy that, that fixed the problem? Uh, it, that, that is addressing the problem currently, yes. So the wells you had to replace, was there a certain depth, like 100 feet or 140 feet? Yeah, what are we looking at, 80 to 90 feet is, is where we saw some of the problem areas? Don't I was trying away. to get out the exit. Yeah. Um, uh, so based on the monitoring well data that we have out there, we evaluate how deep the contamination is, and then we go a step further when we're looking at drilling a deeper residential well. Even if that residential well, in the last uh, year and a half, we've drilled two, and we've just gone below the plume into the bedrock aquifer. And now I'm not saying that the water is always a better quality because bedrock isn't always as palatable for some people as the sandy water to drink, but it is still contaminant free from the army. We keep testing those wells even after they're redrilled. So they're still part of the program. Okay, thank you. I'll let I guess I can't speak to the long term. Yeah. Well, and that'll be part of, I mean, the, um, the long-term viability of a well. Um, I'll point it back to the hydro folks, to, you know, the, the concern and the, the, what precautions need to be taken to make sure that that concern is, is readily addressed. Um, but it, there is, you know, what you've seen tonight uh, is some opportunities to, you know, when we talk about addressing the source, I, I, I fear that we are kind of re-baselining what the source is. You know, the original source, per se, were those waste pits. It was the burning ground. That's where the source was. You know, what we're seeing is the, what we would now term the source of 2019 as we re-baseline how we're addressing the problem. So, um, Yes, we are talking about more source areas, but at, at the same time, th this is a problem that uh, occurred many years ago, uh, and we're doing our best to get the genie back in the bottle, for lack of a better way to say that, I think. Um, that, uh, you know, recognizing that the earlier actions truly did address those original source areas, but what we're talking about today, and really there would be more secondary sources, but they are opportunities to accelerate uh, and address the concerns that have been, and, and is it fair to say, um, uh, the, the kind of like the, the cloud hanging over because of the, the concern over the drinking water. So, um, uh, but you know, these are the options uh, that are proven to be effective. Um, and, I, and I think with a combination um, based on what we're seeing that uh, there'll be opportunities to uh, put something together, uh, a combination of these that'll be effective. I, you know, I, I don't live here, I, so I, I have to be, I, I want, I am sensitive, but you know, the current, the, the past comment, for example, Mike, Mike Sitton, you mentioned about the fear. Uh, you know, what I, I still go back to, you know, the state, EPA, 
the enforcement standard is more the baseline for safety. The, the, the preventive action levels, I understand there's, rec there's, real, there's a the concern is a reality, but the, the, the preventive action levels are still, you know, when you're talking about safe versus unsafe, you know, if you're at the preventive action levels, that would, that would we do consider that the remedy being successful. So we can't, you know, we're going to put together a process that addresses uh, the risks, uh, but I think sometimes we, you know, some of these figures here showing the large extent of the, the, the PAL exceedances. Um, you know, the, the PALs were intended to identify the extent of our problem, uh, areas that we need to focus on. The risk assessment has now helped to focus on which are those contaminants of concerns that we need to uh, make sure our remedy adequately addresses. Uh, but then the enforcement standards is going to be where we're, we're looking at safe. And, um, you know, th there, there have been some unfortunate cases in the last couple of years where the wells have been replaced. And uh, we acknowledge that uh, and, and are, are taking the, the, the actions to do it. But uh, th there is an issue of, of the preventive action levels um, and, and, and enforcement standards and which ones are you baselining to call uh, is the groundwater safe or not. I, it's, I offer that as a observation, uh, fully recognizing that I don't, hear, I don't live here in the community. So I, I don't want to, I just want to make sure it's, it's put in the right context. Mike, isn't it true that um, even when the remedy is in place and we've declared success more or less, we still have a requirement to do um, an every five year evaluations to make sure that the remedy remains protective um, and that's, that just continues. So it isn't, even after we've, you know, we have no more exceedances of the enforcement standard, that doesn't mean we're done. And there's a variation of that, but the, the enforcement standards are what's considered, uh, what would be considered the end of, of uh, in many cases, the, uh, the option, you know, the, the remedy. Because uh, it's just like drinking water standards. Uh, you know, we'll continue to monitor, uh, as noted, we'll be here, uh, the on-site areas, we'll be monitoring for periods of time. Uh, I think a, a variation of the model that's been applied for many years here, um, where we found concentrations that even got close, you know, above the PALs, we started to increase the frequency from maybe annually to, to uh, quarterly to make sure we fully understood the extent of the problem. But then, uh, you know, as we get past the meeting the enforcement standards, we're going to be coming back for our five-year reviews or even interpreted. You know, I'm not suggesting here today we. we you know, 30 years from now, we go to sampling every five years, but there probably will be some relaxing of the, maybe we wouldn't go away completely, uh, but at the same time, uh, maybe annual sampling is, uh, for all the wells is not the answer either. So uh, it's really looking at the data and seeing what the data, where that drives us um, as we go forward. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. In similar army, um, in army sites with this type of contamination, what has worked better, the pump and treat or the anaerobic bioremediation? It, you know, is um, the the. the Understanding has evolved over time. I would offer the technology of choice today is a um, is more of the in situ or the anaerobic degradation. Um, pump and treating was you know, we, we have many pump and treat systems throughout the army, uh, but in many cases what we're finding is they are containing the plume, so it's not migrating any further. But we're really not seeing the the area the plume reach uh, the cleanup levels that were established, whether the, the MCLs or the, the equivalent of the 140, depending on whatever state we're in. Uh, so sometimes the, 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 the pump and treat, we've had some examples um, up in, I think up in New England in the Joint Base Cape Cod, our former uh, Massachusetts military reservation, sandy soils, pump and treat, more conducive, has shown to be more successful. You know, it kind of goes back to our conceptual site model, understanding the geology, you know, the, uh, uh, through experience, some of the pump and treat systems, while effective, then they're reducing mass, 
Uh, and that's really, I think, if you look at some of the past data for the ERM and MERM, they're reducing mass. We're seeing some reduction of concentrations, but at some point they start to level out, and they start to level out above what would be considered, uh, you know, the end of the program in terms of the uh, meeting the enforcement standards for for a site like this. Okay. The reason I ask that is we have some familiarity with the the pump and treat because it was used at the propellant burning ground, but I was concerned in this report summary where it, there was an increase in the DNT because of rising groundwater that would have gotten that source contamination soil under the cap. My question is then, when you use the anaerob anaer anaerobic bioremediation method, does it just treat the water or does it also go up, uh, upstream to the source? Did, did we add the slide, the backup slide? Uh, at the end? You're yeah. So the, 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 this is intended to uh, kind of get to that. Um, so we would we would ha we have our spill. This is this is a generic model. Uh, we we have a spill at a site. Uh, it migrates uh, through the overlying soil into the groundwater starts to make its way down gradient. Then we have a series of, of wells, injection wells here, where we're pumping in the, in this case it would be the vegetable oil, creating this yellow, what we would call the treatment zone. Those are the, those are the areas where we're taking that groundwater environment from what was probably an aerobic, having a certain dissolved oxygen concentration over here, to an anaerobic where there's no oxygen, so you allow those uh, bugs uh, to kind of do their magic. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's you know, M&A is kind of like letting uh, Mother Nature do its own thing uh, on its own. This is kind of kickstarting the process to help get those natural processes that would, uh, could exist by, by creating the right environment. So then the groundwater continues to move. So then it's somewhat replaced by you know, new, new contaminants. So you have this contaminant treatment zone. So as it moves through the zone, trying to treat the water. And, and what we tried to show on some of the slides, when we do the injections, it's going to, it's going to create, based on our current estimates, that positive environment in the subsurface that would allow this yellow area to persist for up to two years. And that's, that, you know, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be based on sampling and experience going forward. Okay, so if I'm understanding tonight's um, presentation correctly, it sounds like the anaerobic bioremediation that is done throughout the plume is probably the best solution. The, it, it is, it is, has promise. Um, the, the trick is, is always gonna be getting it to the right location, because okay. you're pushing. You know, it, it, I always like to, you know, the difference between the pump and treat versus the anaerobic, the, the, the pump and treat you're pulling, and then the, this one you're pushing in. Linda, what's second, Linda had a question, I think, or a comment. I have a question, actually. Is it common practice to have a combination of alternatives for um, the actual remedy? Since you're asking the question and you're in the business, you know the answer is yes. I do know the answer. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, 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 a, it's a prompt for you. Well, and, 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 thank you. And, well, and that's why I, I did use and directly the reference earlier between, you know, the similarities between monitored natural attenuation where we take advantage of what mother nature would do on its own versus uh, this, the, this system where we're kickstarting it or trying to promote the right environment so that, you know, it kind of goes back to it. And, and in this case, if we see promise with the injections, we would look to, to re-inject uh, at a period of time. So you're getting that substrate back in, this, in the groundwater to create that positive environment. Um, but it's all based on the sampling, what the, what the data kind of tells us on, on how it's successful. But more than likely, a lot of these systems, it kind of, this gets the, the intent is for the uh, anaerobic biodegradation to get the process started, and then you transition into an MNA type remedy. There was another hand, I thought. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have some concerns about the, how the propellant burning ground is defined, especially, uh, where it crosses uh, County Z, and I live on County Z, and it's shown now that it's totally east of my buildings, but uh, yet the B and C uh, monitoring wells that are west of my buildings did show some contamination previously. So 
I have a almost 50 year old bedrock well that has never had a problem but until there's a problem with the casing so I don't like to be just left high and dry. That's a specific I, 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 I'm not sure what the specifics to, to help out on the answer so I'll, I'll ask Joel or Brian to Um, Brian, based on the monitoring data from those two wells to the west of your place, there is no more contamination in those wells above that prevented action limit. And so there had been in the past, the plume was, so if we're looking at the propellant burning ground plume off site, the plume had been further over to the west at one time. And we did have monitoring wells even further that were out there that are now abandoned. And the plume has moved, the entire plume here has shrunk further to the east. So it, it's just a factor of time. You, how do you determine that? I mean, there's the differences between the Korean War and the Vietnam War, and perhaps another plume is coming. Um, based on just the wells that we have up gradient and the time that we've been monitoring for the last 20 to 30 years, I've seen a continuous for volatiles for those chlorinated solvents, a continual drop in everything on this side of the plume and the concentration has dropped just in this direction and the same thing has been happening on this edge. That's all. Okay, but Perhaps a periodical uh, testing of my well would make me feel better. Okay. I know we did do your well last, a last year. year. Ago. A year yeah. ago, yes. Yes. All right, okay. thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> oh, I was ready to exit stage left. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, in, uh, in your decision process, I'm assuming that it could be a, a mix of alternatives that are it will, selected, yeah. correct? Yes. Not, not one size fits all. It, you're absolutely correct. And that was one of the reasons of even breaking it up into, you know, when we kind of look at what was done in the past, you know, it was kind of like a one size fits all versus, uh, you know, for each of the three plume areas, a, a combination um, based on what we know today. Yes, thank you all. At this time, what we'd like to do um, is open it up to um, your comments. Uh, but before we do that, I was reminded uh, that if you haven't signed in, please sign in on your way out. Uh, and if you're wanting the information, uh, make sure we get the email uh, and we'll make sure the information gets to you, the Army will. So at this time, uh, We've got about 10 or 15 minutes for open comments. It's your comments. Uh, uh, not necessarily expecting an answer, just something uh, that you want to say. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say oh. I, I got a loud voice. <laughs> okay. um, I just wanted to say, whoever, I think these are very well done and very helpful, and um, it'll be real nice to review these at home because it's way too much to take in just hearing it. So I think great job who's ever responsible for these. Uh, I'll uh, second that. But um, th uh, this is actually a RAB um, issue. At the last meeting it was brought up that the Merrimack Sanitation District that was formed as a result of of the water district being potentially put in would like to have a seat on the board. And I think it was brought up and tabled. So is that something we can talk about tonight or? Because I've been asked by the town board to <laughs> bring that up. I'm not Michelle? 
Yeah, so uh, because of the, uh, the public uh, meeting portion of this, I wasn't really planning on taking up that issue tonight. Um, so one of the things I think after we get through uh, the comment um, period here, I'd like to talk about a uh, future RAB meeting um, uh, where we can't focus on the RAB business and, uh, and that's one of the things that does need to be discussed. I uh, wasn't going to try to to run that uh, portion tonight. I just uh, sort of getting late, and I knew we were going to spend a lot of time on the two reports. But I'm sort of thinking sometime, and and I hadn't really had a chance to talk to you, Michelle, about possible dates. But I'm thinking sometime in the um, uh, mid to late February time frame for for a RAB. Uh, and again, uh, that would be focused primarily on membership and then uh, administrative aspects of the RAB. And we might have a few updates at that point, but it would mainly focus on RAB business. So. I said, can the RAB meet without you? If Michelle would call a meeting, could we have that such a thing? Well, technically, uh, as uh, we're co-chairs, so technically, um, as it goes to pertaining to the RAB business, I'd, I'd like to be here. Um, now, having said that, there's nothing to say we couldn't do it differently. So do I have to physically be here? Uh, could you pull, uh, could we go ahead and hold a meeting? I could uh, participate via conference call or something like that. I mean, I, I would be open to something to that event. So if you wanted to do it sooner. So, you know, we can talk about that. I don't think it's ever been done before. But um, Now, having said that, the RAB members are certainly always welcome to get together. Um, but technically, to, to hold a RAB meeting, uh, you know, all parties need to be there. So. The RAB, RAB is not just the community. So the RAB consists of the Army, the WDNR, the WDHS, um, the landholders. You know, the RAB is not just community members. Now, when you have a TAP, the TAP's responsibility is to the community members, but the but that doesn't that isn't the entire RAB. The RAB consists of a number of different parties besides just the community. I mean, you all live here. If you want to get together and talk, I mean, that's the idea. You know, the RAB is supposed to represent the community. So hopefully, you are talking to other people in the community who don't get to come to these meetings. But it's not a RAB meeting when it doesn't include. RAB members, especially the two co-chairs. So, yeah, so I, I offer those two alternatives. One is either face-to-face, uh, -face probably uh, in the uh, mid to late February time frame. The other option would be, uh, if you all want to pursue, is, uh, you know, I can do it telephonically uh, if you want to do it sooner. So, 